Watch your step, the ferry captain told me, opening the gate. It's a long way down and the water's cold. The sea had been choppy on the way across from the mainland. The sky gray and foreboding of rain. Captain Flanders and I had talked the whole time inside the warmth of his cabin, as I attempted to soothe my nerves with conversation, and to distract myself from what was right outside the windows all around us. Don't look outside. Don't look at the water. Pretend you're at home in the city on dry land. It had partially worked. I, I hadn't thrown up, and uh, that was an improvement from my last time at sea. My legs were wobbly as I stepped across the gap, trying not to look down. Despite the pier being totally still, I felt my body swaying up and down with the phantom sway of the ocean waves we'd experienced during our two-hour journey on the small boat. I was safely on the island now. That pit in the bottom of my stomach should have been going away. But it wasn't. Why did I still feel so uneasy? The words of the ferry captain came to mind again from our conversation during the boat ride. You be careful on Crimson, you hear me? He'd said. You seem like a nice enough fellow. Though I don't pay much mind to what happens on the island. I do hear things. An old timer like me. We hear things. We stow them away for safekeeping. And one thing I add is that this island ain't so kind to outsiders. If you start to feel nervous for any reason, you pack up, you head for dry land, okay? Seagulls laughed and swooped through the air nearby on a rock-strewn beach littered with bottles and old newspapers. A thunderhead in the distance crackled to life with electricity, flashing white momentarily and startling me from my recollections. I looked back to see the ferry captain standing on the other side of the bridge. An anxious look writ large across his face. Thanks again, I said to the man, careful as I made my way across the slippery wooden boards, my feet wanting to skid and slide with each step forward, and I braced myself with one hand, grabbing onto the thick rope which served as a railing. It looked as if I was the only one visiting the island, I realized, as the captain closed the gate behind me and went back to his cabin. The vessel was small, and I hadn't seen anyone else aboard. Still, I was surprised to confirm that I was the only passenger. Over here, detective. A man was calling me from the gravel parking lot nearby, and I walked over towards him. He was slender, with glasses and a mustache, carrying a coffee cup in one hand and a donut in the other. The policeman was wearing a worn, salt-stained blue rain slicker, more befitting a fisherman than a man of the law. Rain began to patter down on us from above as he met me halfway, popping the donut into his mouth and taking my bag with his free, white powder-covered hand. Welcome to Crimson Island, he said, his mouth chewing the donut and making it disappear in one large swallow. We spoke on the phone. I'm Chief Varnson, but you can just call me Bill. Nice to meet you, Bill. I wasn't expecting you to meet me out here, but I appreciate it. Can you point me in the direction of a motel or a bed and breakfast? I don't need much, just somewhere to lay my head overnight. Our voices were drowned out by the increasing noise of the rainstorm, and I had to speak loudly to be heard. Thunder boomed a ways off in the distance, drawing nearer. Nothing like that around here, he said, opening the passenger door of his car to let me in. But you can stay with me if you like. My wife passed away a couple years back, and I wouldn't mind the company. How long did you plan on being here? As long as I have to. I'll take you up on the bed offer. I'll pay you for the hospitality. I'm not one to freeload. Besides, my client is paying for my room and board. We both got in and he started the engine. Rain dripped off of us and he turned on the heat and the wiper blades as it began to fall even harder. A staccato beat like pounding drums on the roof of the car as we drove toward town. Who is your client, anyway? I wasn't clear on that when we spoke on the phone. That I'm not at liberty to discuss, unfortunately, but I, I do appreciate your help, Chief Varnson. Bill. Right. Thanks again, Bill. As he turned down a gravel road, I saw something in the trees, retreating suddenly as we approached. A large, hulking shape like a bear, but not quite. Lots of wildlife on the island? I asked, suddenly nervous. I think I just saw something. 
Could have been a bear. I'm, I'm not sure. No bears around here. Closest thing we got is deer. Brought over from the mainland at some point by hunters. So they had something to do. But the damn things are out of control nowadays. They probably outnumber the people ten to one. Not that that's saying much. We drove past a lot of abandoned houses on the outskirts of town. Many of them half collapsed with their roofs caving in. But as we got further along, I saw houses with cars outside and their lights on, so I suppose it wasn't a complete ghost town. Why did so many people pack up and move away? I asked. Uh, there's not many jobs left on Crimson since the cannery closed. Fishing ain't what it used to be. Every year I look around and there's a few less familiar faces. No sense sticking around if there's no jobs. That's the way I figure it. He drove through downtown and we finished the journey in an awkward silence. This is it, Bill said as we arrived outside an old two-story building with a porch out front. A battered sign with faded blue letters swayed in the wind on rusty chains from the eaves, and I barely made out the words, Police Station. He showed me the ramshackle bullpen with its single small jail cell, leading me up a set of creaking wooden stairs at the rear of the main level. There was a small guest room on the second floor with an uncomfortable bed and dusty sheets where I could lay my head for the night. The only amenity was a hard wooden chair which I sat on for a while, looking out the window at the falling droplets glowing in the street lamp's light. The town was quiet aside from the sound of pounding rain and rumbling thunder in the distance. I didn't see anyone walking the streets until the following morning. By then, the sun was outshining, and my mood had grown considerably warmer with the weather. Still, I'd be happy to get this case over with and get home, I thought to myself. This little town was rubbing me the wrong way. Its people were polite, but somehow cold at the same time. A cheerful voice called out, Good morning, to me, and I looked up to see someone approaching me on the street. I was standing out on the veranda, enjoying the fresh air, after a long night of allergies and unwashed bed linen. You must be the detective, a woman in a flowery yellow dress said, smiling blandly and pushing her baby down the road in a stroller. I'm Cindy Fox, and this is little Susie. We were just out for a stroll, and I thought we'd pop by and say hello. I was slightly stunned by the interaction. Everything about it just felt odd. The woman's smile was forced and tight telling me she wasn't as happy as her voice indicated. Even her baby didn't look right. Her eyes were too intelligent and seemed to study me, judging me like an outsider, which I supposed I was. Uh, nice to meet you, I managed to say, my throat dry and tight. Susie and Cindy, very pretty names. Can I ask, how did you know I was a detective? And I should mention, I'm a private detective now. I'm not with the police force anymore. Oh, we know. It's a small community here on the island, Detective. Word gets around very quickly. Nothing's kept secret for long. She walked off without another word, leaving me with that growing sense of unease again. What was it about this place? Was there something in the drinking water making everyone act so strange? No wonder my client had hired me to look into the suspicious circumstances surrounding the disappearance of... Getting settled all right? A voice asked from behind me, interrupting my thoughts. It was Bill, the police chief. He walked right past me out onto the gravel road, yawning and stretching as if the main street were his living room. Yeah, so far so good, I said. Hey, can you point me towards the general store? I need to get something to eat. They'll be closed today. It's a Monday. On the island, just about everything is closed on Sundays and Mondays. Damn. I didn't bring much with me. Is there a, a place nearby I could get somebody to tide me over till tomorrow? Head up to the marina, Bill said, pointing down the street. It's right near where I picked you up last night. Closest thing to a corner store we got on the island. If you keep going past the docks, you'll see it. Uh, did you want a lift? Nah, I'm good. I could use the exercise. Thanks for the offer, though. Alright, suit yourself. Enjoy your walk, detective. I started heading off, and he called after me, telling me to wait. You know, if you told me what you were investigating, it would make it a lot easier for me to help you. I'm just saying, that's all. I know you got your deal with your client, but between two men of the law, 
I think it should be all right to bend the rules a little bit, don't you? He had been persistent on the phone as well. The chief liked to know what was happening in his own backyard, and I couldn't blame him for that. I'll give it some thought, I said, trying to be diplomatic. You might have a point. Fair enough, he allowed, and I kept going on my way, my stomach rumbling with emptiness. I got about twenty paces down the road before I saw another face. A man was trimming his bushes near the street, using a giant, oversized pair of hedge clippers. His smile was similarly wide and welcoming, just like the chief. Just like the woman with the baby stroller and the baby. But I couldn't help picturing him taking those hedge clippers and sneaking up behind somebody with them, closing them around their neck and sending their head flying off like the top of a dandelion. Good morning, detective. Fine day for a walk. The man continued snipping the greenery with his enormous shears as I approached, but his eyes were fixed on me. By the time I got near to him, he was only trimming the air, missing the plant entirely. Hello, I said, my anxiousness increasing again. Heh, it seems as if everyone in town knows about me. I tried to say this in as friendly of a tone as I could, but it was becoming difficult to maintain my composure. Oh, well, it's a small place, Crimson Island. Word gets around quickly. I'm David O'Brien, the town gardener. I keep all the hedges trimmed round here. Mow the grass, plant the flowers, all that dirty business. Ha <laughs> ha! I tend to the cemetery as well, don't you know? His voice was heavily accented, and it was difficult to understand the man. He seemed to be trying to hold in laughter, as if some joke were very funny, but I wasn't privy to it. After his introduction, he turned on his heel and wandered off to another part of the property, giggling, his hedge clippers dragging in the grass behind him, digging up the immaculately maintained sod with reckless abandon. The interaction left me feeling disturbed, even more than I already was, and that was saying a lot. I was beginning to consider shortening my stay on Crimson Island perhaps leaving tonight to come back with official reinforcements would be the safest bet. Any longer than that, and I might find out where my client's sister had ended up much more intimately than I would like. Continuing on my walk, I passed several more residents. They were mowing the grass, sitting on their porches, sipping coffee, and walking down the street with dogs on leashes. And yet, each time the same thing happened. "'Good morning, detective,' cheered a man, fetching his mail. That same vacant look in his eyes and the same inhibited grin that was growing so familiar. He produced a knife from his pocket and I had jumped backwards, but then I saw he was just using it to open his mail. He did so smiling, his eyes never leaving mine. I hurried away, moving briskly down the street again, my head turning on a swivel. Good morning, detective, laughed an elderly man on his porch, whittling something that resembled a pagan idol while resting on a rocking chair in the shade. Fine day for a walk. Good morning, detective, a woman walking her poodle said, startling me as she appeared from nowhere on the other side of me. I jumped back and spiked my spine against the top of a picket fence, crying out in pain. She tilted her head and went past, grinning and giggling as if my injury were the funniest thing in the world. Even her dog was smiling at me. Was I losing my mind? I picked up my pace, trying not to look alarmed. It felt as if I was surrounded by bloodthirsty animals rather than well-wishing pedestrians. There was a forested area on either side of the road up ahead, and I rushed towards it. By then, I couldn't help myself. I stopped, and I turned around, looking back at the town square. Everyone on the street was stock still and glaring at me when I turned around. The smiles gone from their faces, replaced by blank stares. Shuddering, I looked away instinctively. It felt like I was in an episode of the Twilight Zone. I began to walk again, hurrying through the forested area towards the marina up ahead. It wasn't far, and yet I was feeling more terrified than I had ever been in my life. Suddenly, I remembered the bear that I had seen in the woods the day before. Bill said it couldn't have been, but it sure looked big, whatever it was. Darting my gaze to either side... I looked into the shadows of the trees, trying to see if anything was pursuing me. To my dismay, there was. A dark form was moving from tree to tree, 
blending in with the shadows and just barely visible. It was moving in the same direction I was, but on a diagonal, its trajectory headed to cut me off up ahead. I hurried even faster, running through the trees as fast as my legs would take me. The thing moved quickly despite its size, but not as fast as me. After a while, I managed to gain a lead on it by sprinting, and I was soon out of the forested area completely. I went over to the building with a large sign out front reading, Marina, Gas and Snacks. The bell above the door tinkled as I entered, huffing and puffing, feeling out of breath from my short run, so terrified I'd completely forgotten to breathe for a few moments. Can I help you? A man wearing a green trucker hat asked from behind the counter. I took him in, trying to decide if he was all right. He was the first person who didn't greet me with a smile, knowing exactly who I was before I even opened my mouth. For some reason, I took that as a good sign. Maybe he wasn't one of them, whoever they were. Still, I didn't dare risk telling him what I'd just seen. I tried to calm myself and just act as if everything was normal. I tried to fool myself a little bit, even telling myself that maybe it actually was. Maybe I'd just been seeing things out there. Just looking for something to eat, I said, scanning the half bear shelves. Not much to go around today. We get new stock on Tuesday, he replied, pointing to some off-brand chips and soda. There was also a rack with expired bags of pretzels and an assortment of gum. Nothing with any protein or sustenance to it. I would have settled for beef jerky, but they didn't even have that. It would be a long day at this rate, I thought, my stomach gurgling loudly again. I put a few items on the counter and gave the man his money, not feeling the least bit satisfied with my purchases of sodium and empty calories. There was a sign over the man's shoulder which said they sold tickets for the ferry. What time does the boat leave today? I asked, thinking I would make a break for it while it was still possible to do so. It doesn't. No ferry on Mondays. Oh. My heart began to hammer faster. Another 24 hours on Crimson Island. That didn't sit well with me at all. I had planned to stay for a few weeks, but now I just wanted out. Uh, can I buy a ticket for tomorrow? Sure you can. That'll be 15 bucks. He said, printing off a receipt. He handed it to me and put my items in a bag. I turned around and started walking out of the little building when he called after me. Sorry to hear you're leaving so soon, detective. We do hope you'll visit us again. My blood ran cold as I opened the door and walked out, not looking back. I didn't even have to see him to know that he was smiling as I left. I could hear it in his voice. I pulled out my cell phone and saw an out-of-service message displayed across the top, just like it had said the night before. Knowing I had to get a message back to one of my colleagues about this place before it was too late, I started hurrying back towards the police station. The shadow thing in the forest pursued me again on my walk back into town, this time choosing to remain at a distance. I only hoped it would stay that way. Make yourself look big. Speak in a low, loud voice. And never, ever run. I remembered hearing those things about grizzly bears. Maybe they would translate to this situation as well. Don't let them know you're scared. Pretend you're more powerful than you are. I had to get a message back home and get some backup out here pronto. The idea was clear in my mind as I speed walked out of the forest down the street towards the police station, trying not to make eye contact with the smiling faces who walked past, greeting me one after another. By the time I got back to the police station, I was out of breath and exhausted, shaking as I closed the door behind me. Bill was nowhere to be seen. I went straight over to the phone on his desk and picked it up to find the line was dead. All the connections looked fine, so I went upstairs to my little bedroom, thinking maybe I could get some cell signal up there. I needed to get a call out to the mainland somehow. I needed help. But of course, the phone didn't work. My stomach rumbled and gurgled again, and I looked at the bag of pretzels I had purchased, thinking it wouldn't be wise to eat them. It would be better to starve than to risk eating anything from this place. Still, the longer I sat there staring at the bag, the more I began to think I was being foolish. It was a sealed bag of pretzels. There was no way anybody tampered with it. I opened the bag and began to munch on the salty snacks. Of course, I got thirsty and opened the soda I had purchased as well, hearing the hiss of carbonation and the click of the seal, and taking that as a good sign for my safety. 
Although I didn't recognize either brand name of the pretzels or the soda, they tasted pretty good. Only faintly strange. After eating and drinking for a while, I sat looking out the bedroom window, sitting up in the chair and trying to decide my next move. My eyelids began growing heavy as I saw people converging outside the police station, wearing brown hooded robes and carrying torches, pitchforks, and pikes. I tried to stand up, but I couldn't. My legs were numb and my arms weighed a thousand pounds suddenly. They hung limply at my sides. Distantly, I heard someone open the door to the bedroom as I began to fade in and out of consciousness. Looking up at the people in the doorway, I saw Bill was standing there staring at me, and I realized that I was laying on the floor now. Uh, the pretzels, I mumbled. Poison. He began putting zip ties around my wrists and cinching them together tightly. Sorry, detective, he said, looking down at me. It's so hard to get sacrifices for Belisama these days. No tourists come to Crimson Island anymore. We had to start getting creative to appease her. Belisama? The word was strange and unfamiliar. I tried to think what it could mean, but my mind felt like it was full of quicksand. Come on, let's go to the ceremony. It's just about to begin, but can't start without you. You're the guest of honor, detective. I passed out after hearing those words, and dreamt of drowning in brackish waters, screaming and taking in salt water instead of air as the undertow dragged me deeper. When I woke up, I was hanging from a rope, tied upside down to a pole. The water was beneath my face, and it was only a few inches away. The residents of the town were on the beach, wearing robes and chanting as the waves lapped at their bare feet. Chief Varnson was at the center of them all, looking out at me and holding an open book in his hands. The ancient tome looked weather-worn and salt-stained from decades or perhaps centuries of use. Beside him stood a gigantic man, at least eight feet tall, wearing a hat made from a bear's head. The thing which had been pursuing me in the forest had been a man after all. An enormous man, nearly the size of a grizzly. He would have subdued me and brought me here but that hadn't been necessary. I'd done their work for them by eating the tainted food laced with sedatives. You, detective, will serve as a sacrifice to Belisama, goddess of the seas, the one who blesses all fishermen with good yields. As the tide comes in, it will plunge your head beneath the cleansing salt water, and the goddess herself will come to visit you as you take your last breaths. Be thankful, detective. You should be honored to see her visage. I screamed as the waves began to tickle my forehead. Then the sea started to submerge my face completely with occasional white caps as the tide came in and the water rose higher and higher, engulfing my face. Gulping in a belly full of water, I felt terrified and sick. The liquid went up my nose and I felt panic rising inside of me as I struggled to reach the surface but couldn't. I was completely submerged, thrashing while I dangled upside down in the surging waves. The ocean water was cold but clear, revealing the reef below with schools of fish and kelp that danced in front of me and tickled my face. As I started losing consciousness, I saw something else as well. A beautiful woman was swimming towards me. I thought for a moment, perhaps, that she was coming to save me. But then she opened her yawning mouth to reveal her teeth, long and sharp enough to rip the flesh from my bones, curved and serrated like a piranha. A long tail flowed out behind her, the coloring of it black and white like a killer whale. Belisama. Her skin looked blue in the water, her serrated tooth smile growing wider as she swam closer to me. I squirmed and bucked against the ropes holding me, but it was no use. I cringed as she got close enough to scrape her fingernails against my cheek. 
She opened her mouth wider than I would have thought possible when I closed my eyes, waiting for it to close around my neck. But then suddenly I felt myself being lifted upwards by the rope around my ankles. My head emerged from the water to see a blessed sight. Captain Flanders, the ferry captain who brought me over to the island, was pulling me up onto the deck of a small fishing boat. Meanwhile, on the shoreline, the residents of Crimson Island were screaming and throwing things in our direction. Several of them were even wading out into the water in their cultish robes, looking ready to climb aboard the vessel and attack us. Those unfortunate souls ended up filling in as sacrifices to Belisama, as she didn't differentiate between her worshippers and the tourists. All she saw was meat, and the goddess was hungry. The water turned red with their blood, and I saw limbs flying through the air, and their terrified faces screaming and gurgling in the salt water. But then the boat began to move, and those horrible sights and sounds faded into the distance. Pretty soon all I could hear was the roar of the engine, and I closed my eyes, trying to forget the nightmare of Crimson Island. I wish I had better news for my client, but I'm going to have to pass this case on to higher authorities. This mystery is far beyond my pay grade. But either way, I'm pretty sure I know what happened to her sister. Belly Sama is always hungry, and she has a taste for tourists now. I was called out on an emergency dive on the 12th of April, 2013. Back then, I usually did forensic and rescue dives, but this was something different entirely. Usually when I get called out, time is a definite and measurable factor. For example, someone could be in mortal danger, or there is a time-sensitive object that needs to be retrieved. This time though, the objective wasn't clear. The first impression was that this was something catastrophic. I was called up in the middle of the night with no warning, and there was talk of a measurable geological event. I wasn't briefed, and every person involved just stonewalled me with a barrage of I don't knows. I knew pretty much anyone who worked on my level statewide, but these people were just gray-faced, anonymous nobodies. They drove me all the way to Greenbrier Valley, West Virginia. Just imagine this middle-of-nowhere dirt road covered by government-issued vehicles. Off the top of my head, I registered people from the USACE, United States Army Corps of Engineers, the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and USGS, United States Geological Survey, and not to mention the WVDNR, West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Those were just the ones I recognized, but at least half of the vehicles were unmarked or straight-up lies. I swear, one of them claimed to be a goddamn catering business. I was pushed through a crowd of people, some were screaming at their phones, others were screaming at one another. There was this one red-faced, middle-aged man almost crying with frustration at a young woman. He kept waving his papers at her, and all she did was nod and smile. Somewhere along the line, people started asking me questions. What's the ETA on your prep? Did you bring your own gear? Are you signed in? Where's the sign in? There were other people I'd work with on site. There was Garrett, who just turned 44, and Nora. I'd worked with Nora on a couple rescue dives, but nothing of the scale. There were a few faces in the crowd that I vaguely recognized, but Garrett and Nora stood out. They were already suiting up. They were preparing for a cold dive and checking their equipment. I had some papers shoved in my hands. As I signed in, I could see a bubble of people forming around one of the USACE representatives and an older woman in a professional pantsuit. You got 12 hours, said the woman in the pantsuit. Not a second longer. This is private property. We can stall, said the representative. We can drag you through the courts. Go ahead. I'm sure the judge is eager to hear you explain your sudden interest in our property. You don't have to explain shit, you fucking vulture. In 12 hours, you will be considered trespassers. We will bring in private security, and you'll be escorted off the premises. The woman in the pantsuit took a step forward, stabbing at the USAC representative with a stack of papers. Our congressman is eager to have you defunded, you fucking dolt. As the conversation died down, the representative was left seething in the dirt. She was fuming, and no one dared approach her. After a few seconds, she stormed off. 
Fucking hatchetman. Someone in the crowd whispered as the woman in the pantsuit walked off. Goddamn war criminals. Garrett waved me over and I sat down on a log next to him. I started to dress down. Someone needs to talk to me, I said. Someone tell me what's going on. Earthquake, said Nora. Not a big one, but yeah. What the fuck does this have to do with an earthquake? It's the lake, said Garrett. You'll see. Still putting on my gear, we were pushed forward. They took me by the arm and forced me on, drowning me in questions along the way. When we finally stepped through a forest clearing, uh, what was supposed to be a small lake opened up to us. Except it wasn't a lake anymore. The water had been drained, leaving only a bed of dirt behind. Hundreds of seagulls picking at dying fish and a cacophony of screeches. Men in hazmat suits were trying to chase them off, but only ended up slipping back and forth in the mud. In the middle of the drained lake was a hole, about six by four feet. It was the only space that still retained water. There were tables set up around it, along with security tape and red flags. About a dozen people spread out around a dozen laptops, making calculations and checking measurements. An anonymous woman popped up next to us, pushing us forward. I could sense the warmth of the sun on the horizon about an hour from dawn. We're doing a blind dive, she said. We need you to be in constant communication with us about anything you see. You'll be going within the hour. We're not doing that, said Garrett. There's no emergency here. There's no... Suddenly Garrett came tumbling into the mud. The woman had pushed him. Oh, you're doing this, she snarled. You're fucking doing this. We're not doing shit until we get... You see that? She interrupted Garrett, pointing to the army vehicles. That right there is a sworn fucking oath. That I will burn your goddamn life to the ground, you cocky fuck. Now you do this. Or you'll never touch a fucking glass of water again. Nora helped Garrett up and we hurried down the hole. I could barely hear anything over the feasting seagulls. I was thankful for the rubber mask keeping me from the smell of dead fish. Two men tried their best to prep the basics, but we had nothing. There was basically no dive plan. No idea about the temperature, the stability, the currents, nothing. These people were completely clueless. The only thing they could answer was the size of what we were getting into. A small quake had revealed a sprawling cave system, which the lake water had drained into, roughly 350 feet wide and 700 feet deep, all underground. I tried my best to wrap my head around it. We tested our co-linked masks and settled on individual tracking lines. We'd be diving for 20 minutes, then set aside 25 for resurfacing and depressurizing. We would be having air tanks on rotation and constant contact with those up at the control. At the slightest sight of trouble, we'd bail, no questions asked. There was no way we'd go in blind for any longer than that. We agreed on resurfacing if there was a comms malfunction, even though we all knew hand signals by heart. This couldn't go wrong on any level. We were still setting up when we were given hand chisels and self-sealing bags. We want samples of everything, they told us. Everything. Let's try to put this into perspective. At this point, we barely knew anything. An earthquake had revealed a cave system on some kind of company property. The size and depth of this was unfathomable. In 12 hours, we would be kicked off the site, possibly so they could perform their own tests. This cave system had been completely isolated, possibly for tens of thousands of years, maybe hundreds. Someone even kept throwing around the term Karu Ice Age, but that seemed improbable. This place could either be a unique resource or a complete waste of our time. We were at least one to two hours in on the countdown when we first dipped our toes in the water. It was much colder than anticipated. As I sat on the edge, dangling my feet in the murky water, one of the on-site technicians double-checked my air tanks. Exciting, isn't it? He smiled. I'm jealous. How come? You get to explore, he chuckled. An actual space that no human eyes have ever seen before. That's not always a good thing, nodded Nora. And there's plenty of that on the ocean floor. We took that first plunge. I could barely see anything because of the mud and the reeds, so we just went straight down. The water got colder with every foot, and little dust particles whizzing past me made it feel like 
driving through a rainstorm. As we got further down, the sense of unease settled in my chest. I'd never been so ill-prepared for a dive, and this was beyond anything I'd experienced. There's a reason why people are advised to stay out of underwater caves. This was, in more ways than one, uncharted waters. We went down about 25 feet, where we finally hit rock bottom. The cave wall was rough and sharp with some kind of thin crystal layer. Salt, I figured. Nora got a sample as anonymous voices buzzed in our ears. I could barely make out half of it. Go deeper, a voice came through. There's nothing up there. We mapped out three different tunnels leading further down. The first one we checked turned out to be so thin my equipment risked snagging on the walls. We backed out and tried another tunnel, until we found one large enough for us to comfortably move through. Still, it was more crawling than swimming. Turtle one, we're getting seismic, a voice came through. Please respond. Stand by, equalizing. I could feel the mechanism from the camera on my shoulder whirring. Garrett came through on the local channel. No way the signal sticks, he sighed. Fucking granite and quartz. This is pointless. Resurface in ten, I said. Check for samples in the cracks. The tunnel led us to a small cave. The water was less murky, but the space was only about 15 by 20 feet, and at most 6 feet high. It was enough for us to regroup, check our tethers, and take a few samples. Nora found some kind of transparent goo lining a crack in the wall, while Garrett tried to chisel off a piece of the granite. I thought I saw something shimmering, but it was just the light from my camera reflecting off a piece of quartz. I grabbed it, though. I, I couldn't come up empty-handed. Once our time was up, we came back up for air. We were slow and methodical, but we were getting results. There was no way we'd reach the bottom in 12 hours, but we figured we could get something interesting, given enough dives. When we came back up, there were at least 50 people standing in a circle to look at us. Men in hazmat suits brought coolers for us to put the samples in, and two technicians were working on a hookah air hose system. We took a short break to wait for them to finish it, change up our air tanks, and plan our second dive. This time we could go deeper. The air hoses could reach 60 feet, but they were already working on an extension. Still, Garrett insisted on refreshing our air tanks as well, just in case. As we hooked up the air hoses, the stiff chemical air from the tanks was exchanged for this musky forest breeze, stinking of dead fish and mud. There was also a little whiff of diesel from one of the on-site generators. As we dove back into the murky waters, we headed straight for the tunnels. This time we were going deeper, past the reeds, past the mud. We mapped out three more tunnels going further and further down. We moved carefully, our new air hoses working as tethers. But it didn't take long for us to reach the limit. Nora called it in. Surface control, we need a longer line. No response. We waited for a moment, but there was nothing on the other end. Time-wise, it was probably around the break of dawn, just like Garrett had said. We'd gone too deep to hold a solid signal. I can go up and relay, said Garrett. Or we can just tug and hope for the best. I'm not tugging on an air hose, chuckled Nora. This... Eh, eh, eh. What? You... Eh, eh, eh. Little burst of static. The camera on my shoulder whirred like crazy. Nora gave me the hand signal for resurfacing and took point. Garrett and I followed. Time to bail. There was a deep rumbling sound coming from beneath. It felt like the ground itself was trying to start a diesel motor. Cycles of rumbling making cracks in the walls. Something big was happening and we had to get out now. I could feel my breath shortening as my body realized that air was no longer a certainty. The moment Nora got through the first tunnel, I saw the rock wall shift. Solid, knife-sharp granite moved with the ease of a child smacking a balloon. To the sound of a deafening thunderstorm, the tunnel collapsed above us. The air hoses got cut, and Nora's foot was crushed into a pulp. Together, they sprayed air and bone fragments into the water, as the sound of our collapsing world got loud enough to rattle my bones. Parts of a blood-curdling screech came through our comms as the water started to move. We were being sucked down. I protected my head as I was tossed around the tunnels further and further down. My air tank clinked against the wall. 
I instinctively gasped for air, but I could feel water rushing into my mask. There was no air supply on the other end. The hose had been cut clean. The walls rushed past me. I slammed my knee, my thigh, my shoulder. At one point, I smacked the back of my head, and I could feel my body temperature shift. It was a wound, but not a deep one. Somewhere in the chaos, I felt the camera on my shoulder come loose, and I got into a roll. I spun out of control and lost all sense of distance. It wasn't just a few seconds of suction either, it was a significant amount of time. My world spun and bashed me into the rocks over and over and over. I could feel blood leaving my body and I was getting cold. Colder and colder, but I couldn't tell if it was blood loss or the water. The word disoriented doesn't begin to describe it. At some point it just stopped. I was floating in this endless pool of darkness, a black bottomless ocean. I couldn't tell what was up and what was down anymore. I tried to move upwards, but it didn't feel right. Not only did my arm refuse to move, but there was too much resistance. It took me a few seconds to realize I was swimming downwards. I was upside down. There was water pooling in my mask. I could feel it just under my mouth. I could see little air bubbles popping, and I had to spit to keep my mouth clear. It had a strange, sugary taste mixed with iron. But most of it was blood. Something grabbed me. My first instinct was to fight, but I couldn't. I had strained my arm, and my left foot was dislocated. I was shivering and I could see a long gash across my thigh. That was just at the limit of what my mask light could pick up. I couldn't even see my feet. Garrett came into focus. He made a hand movement that I didn't recognize. A closed fist with fingers pushing outward. A push. An exhale. Right. I exhaled hard, pushing out the water in my mask. The next second, Garrett connected my air tank to my mask. For a moment, we just looked at one another. He had a bad cut just above his right eye, and it was bleeding into his mask. Our comms were dead. We had to rely on hand signals. Garrett put a hand on my cheek and checked my mask for cracks. It seemed okay. He gave me the signal for okay, and I responded in kind. I was not okay, but I was well enough to move, if only a bit slower. We moved carefully and calmly. There there was no way to tell how far down we were, and we had to be careful to preserve our air. At most, we had a little less than an hour of air if we could keep steady. Probably a lot less, though. Garrett and I held hands, slowly going upwards. It felt right. I I was oriented. We kept moving, but it it felt like we hadn't moved at all. The water was still black and nothing changed. But at one point, Garrett suddenly stopped. I moved up next to him and followed his eyes. He looked upwards. Little shimmers in the water fish? A school of dozens of little fish. They were about four inches long and azure blue. They were completely eyeless with their entire face covered in a thick, octopus-like beak. They avoided us to the best of their ability, shooting past at an amazing speed. Still, they were close enough for Garrett to poke them if he wanted to. He didn't, and neither did I. Whatever these were, they were native to the area. They could be venomous. Garrett tightened his grip on my hand, and we kept moving upwards. After ten minutes of going in a straight line, we came to a full stop. A solid rock ceiling. Just a wall without the hint of an opening or tunnel. It occurred to me that we might have come down horizontally through a side passage. If that was the case, we were doing the human equivalent of a fly buzzing against a window, trying to get out. We looked around, but the ceiling was almost completely flat. There was no telling where we ought to go. Still, I had to try and keep calm. Panicking would just kill us faster. But even with this seemingly endless large space, I'd never felt so trapped in my entire life. I held my breath, trying to slow the shivers. Garrett reached for his chisel. Poking at the wall, he managed to dislodge a few kernels of granite. He stared at them, looking for any sign of movement. Apart from the sinking, they were slightly drifting to our left. Of course, there was a current. I was simultaneously trying to ignore how much time had passed, and at the same time counting the seconds. Garrett's diving watch was busted, and mine hadn't been properly reset before the second dive. It was still on time for our first. This was exactly the kind of shit I wanted to avoid, but we'd been so stressed to get back in. At one point, the ceiling started to curve, and there finally was an opening. 
It seemed to lead upwards. We followed it, squeezing through a tight space where I had to exhale to pass through, shimmying forward breathlessly inch by inch, tons of unstable rock pressing on my aching chest. Then we broke through the surface just like that, except we weren't topside. This was an air pocket. It was large enough to fit us both as long as we squatted a bit. There was a tunnel leading us further, but we decided to catch our breaths. I was the first to shut off my air and clean out my mask, but Garrett was quick to follow. Finally, we could speak freely. Stale, sugary sweet air filled our lungs. I coughed, making my ribs ache even more. The, uh, the lake water, gasped Garrett. It hadn't settled with the uh, temperature shift from the sunrise. That heated it. Got it moving. So where... How deep? At least, uh... At least 300 feet. At least, and that's just... That's just straight down. Nora, did you... No, said Garrett, shaking his head. It closed. She might be trapped down there, but... At least she won't drown. I nodded, gently massaging my foot. I was going to have to pop it back into place, but just touching my skin sent bolts of pain up my shin bone. You could wait, he said. You're hurt. I'm not dying here. Good. We caught our breaths and checked our equipment. We had about three quarters of our tanks left, so we were doing pretty good. We had some cuts and bruises, some that might need stitching. Nothing urgent, but it might get bad if left untreated. Who knew what kind of bacteria was down there? I couldn't stop shivering and Garrett was getting worried. He kept asking if I was sleepy. Honestly, I could feel it. There was something there. Eyelids growing heavy as my lungs strained against my ribs. We got back down underwater, our equipment clean and secured. The tunnels were slowly widening, allowing us to crawl forward. There were a few intersections and we did our best to map where we'd gone. I had some remaining scraps from the ripped air hose that we pushed into cracks in the wall, sort of marking our path like breadcrumbs. At the very least, we could get back to the air pocket if necessary. We went down a few tunnels and we'd be met with a series of dead ends. It was a goddamn labyrinth and my heart sank with every stop. When we finally found a path going forward, we had a difficult choice to make. We could circle back and regroup or push forward and save some time. Every minute moving backwards would be a loss, but every minute moving forward could be a death sentence. Garrett squeezed my hand, looking for some kind of guidance. I signed. Forward. The tunnel opened into a vertical shaft, going straight up. I could feel a slight rush of water gently pushing us back down. It was only for a moment, but it made me realize that the current was getting stronger. Suddenly, the water started to shimmer. Hundreds of azure-colored fish rushed past us, going into the depths of the tunnels. Perhaps they followed the current. Either way, they had to come from somewhere, so we pushed forward. Garrett squeezed my hand in celebration. There was another set of tunnels in the ceiling, branching into several paths. They all looked deep enough to lead somewhere, so we just picked one at random. I couldn't mark our path any further. I had nothing left to leave behind. We kept going upwards until Garrett suddenly stopped. There was something shimmering in the tunnel ahead. Some kind of gemstone or quartz. They reflected the lights of our masks. Another dead end? Or eyes? These nightmare orbs, predatory and unfeeling. An unthinking creature incapable of seeing me as a person. For that one second, I was nothing but meat. It came out from the dark. It had these long, bone-like arms like a rubbery spider monkey. Needle-sharp teeth made for stripping flesh from bone. It didn't swim. It crawled along the rocky walls. And it was fast. Fast enough to catch the little azure fish. It was large, but that didn't slow it down. It could barely squeeze through the tunnel while Garrett and I could move freely. We were never meant to meet that thing. Never. To this day, I can't look down dark corridors. I can imagine those arms reaching out for me. I ignored every safety precaution I'd ever known. I rushed, I huffed, I screamed. I crawled, kicked, and forced my way back down as fast as humanly possible. 
I didn't care about the searing pain in my foot. I just had to keep going. All I could feel was the water moving behind me as every sudden movement transferred into waves pushing against my aching limbs. But I didn't care. At that moment, I didn't care about anything but getting away. At the mouth of the tunnel, I turned around for a brief second, only to see Garrett's wide eyes staring back at me. In that moment, I could tell what he was thinking. He realized that he was about to die. Long fingers wrapped around him as his right arm was ripped from the socket. I could feel the snap reverberating through the tunnel. Vibrations from his death screams reached me, but all I could hear was my own panicked breathing. I remember flashes of shimmering azure as I fled down tunnel after tunnel after tunnel. I didn't see a single marker. Every bump of the foot made my eyes tear up, and I could feel a sore starting to build around the edge of my nose from the crying. There was another air pocket, but I just kept pushing forward. I had no idea where I was, but I could just feel those dark eyes looking for me. Arms reaching for me. The air in my tank started to feel strange. Warm. Panicked, I kept going forward. When I finally came to another air pocket, I tore my mask off and shut the air tank. Everything tasted of blood and salt, and I couldn't stop crying. It was just this small space, just big enough for my head to fit if I tilted it right. The light on my mask was dying. It had started to flicker. If I held it at the right angle, it was fine, but it was just a matter of time. I stayed there for at least ten minutes, just trying to breathe. I was lost and cold. There was no telling how long I'd been down there. I couldn't even tell how much air I had left in the tank, but it wasn't much. If I wanted to move, I, I had to ration it. But I couldn't move without it. There was no way I'd be lucky enough to find another air pocket within, what, a minute of free diving? But I couldn't just stay there. I, I didn't trust a single person up there. There were no rescue parties coming down here anytime soon. Even if they wanted to, could they? Even without a predator stalking these tunnels, I was going to freeze to death. And I was still bleeding. Wait. Bleeding? Shit! My pulse rose as I felt something shift. A pressure in the tunnel underneath. There was no way I could move fast enough. I just had to hope against hope it wouldn't find me. Maybe it didn't hunt like a shark. I held my breath and felt strokes of movement in the water. It was moving this way. I closed my eyes so hard my head started to spin. Tears trickled out of my eyes, making a little plopping noise as they hit the surface of the water. It was barely audible, but to me it felt like hammer blows. The strokes stopped. It was close. I carefully opened my eyes to look down, but everything was dark. My mask light had given up. Moments later, the strokes continued past me. Maybe it wasn't used to hunting humans. Or maybe it was taking its prey back to the nest. When I could no longer feel the strokes, I exhaled, coughing violently. My mouth tasted of blood. There was no choice left. I had to keep going with what little I had. I secured my mask and let my hands rest in the water for a moment. Just floating around in that little space was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. It was such an alien, primal feeling. I'd been in trouble before, but nothing like that. Nothing even remotely like that. I slowed my breathing and took the plunge. To my surprise, there was one strange sensation I hadn't noticed. When the lights were off, it was easier to sense the current. Maybe it was a rely on other senses kind of thing, but it was much clearer. Even in the dark, I could feel the right way for me to go. A circulation of some kind coming from above. As I came to a branching tunnel, it was a bit harder to tell where I was supposed to go. I decided to just keep going up. So I did. The current was getting stronger, and all of a sudden I breached into another air pocket. But I could hear something. A metallic clinking. It didn't take me long to find it. Garrett's air tank. On one hand, I was incredibly lucky. On the other hand, that thing was close. Really close. I still had a little juice left in my air tank, so I hobbled forward. This air pocket was huge, more like a cavern. Ankle-deep water forcing me to walk and actually feel my body weight. I've never felt so heavy in all my life, and the equipment certainly didn't help. I was so tired, I could have easily laid down and just died or slept, whichever came first. 
Instead, I pushed on with an extra tank in hand. I kept going further and further up. I started to hold my breath for as long as I could, using only what little air I had when absolutely necessary. I could feel more of those little fish rushing past me, sometimes with me, sometimes towards me. It dawned on me that they might be fleeing and pursuing Predator, and that I was an idiot for not following them. Then again, they might just be following the current. There was no way to tell. I must have flailed around through several caves, passages, and tunnels for hours, using every air pocket I could find, and eventually just ditching my tank. All I had left was what scraps remained in Garrett's tank. Every foot started to feel like a death sentence, like I was digging my own grave. Maybe if we just stayed put in the first place, someone would have found us. Maybe being proactive was the wrong move. I was going upwards when I felt the air in Garrett's tank start to go bad. When I managed to breach into yet another air pocket, I just threw it aside. This was it. This was the end of the line. The tank clanged against the sides of the cave, and somewhere further in I heard a noise. A little gasp. Something had heard me. I stuck myself to the wall as I heard large, wet feet slapping against the cave floor. It had this strange, frog-like breath, like air pushing against a membrane. I was standing in a painful angle, putting all my weight on my healthy foot. It had stopped. It, It listened. Blood dripping from my arm plopped against the water. Luckily, it didn't hear me or care. Instead, I heard a bone snap like a carrot. Then, the sound of gnawing and eager suckling. I must have stood there paralyzed for at least half an hour. Then I heard it go down a side tunnel and disappear into the deep. This was my shot. I hobbled away only to step on something. A partly devoured foot... From that point on, it was just systematic and careful plunges. Follow the current for 30 seconds. If I couldn't feel a way forward, I turned back, caught my breath, and tried a different path. I was holding my breath so much that my chest had started to ache more than my foot. Still, I was making progress. Finally, I came to this large vertical chute. I felt a rush going upwards. There had to be something, anything... I held my breath for as long as I could, waiting for the surface, the air pocket. But this time there was nothing. Dead end. I just slammed into a smooth surface, knocking myself over the head. A part of me wanted to scream so bad that air pushed out of my lungs. I could feel a cramp in my leg, pain as my body retched and turned. But the surface was smooth. Unnaturally so, almost metallic. I pounded it with my fist. It was thin but heavy. Definitely metallic, but with every pounding fist I could feel something else move. Something was coming up from below. It found me. It started with a tickle against my good leg. These little fingers tenderly wrapping themselves around my ankle, ready to pull me down. I didn't let it. I kicked, crawled, pushed myself upwards, and pounded the metal. A cramp in my arm forced me to scream. Something grabbed me from below, pulling me down at least four feet before I managed to kick myself loose. Gaining momentum, I flung myself upward, again crashing into the metal surface. But this time it buckled. Just an inch, but it buckled. Suddenly there was light. Air. And whatever reached for me recoiled in fear. Four men had moved what looked like a makeshift manhole cover out of the way, and they pulled me up. I didn't even notice I was breathing. I just forced air into my lungs so I could keep screaming and screaming and screaming. Turns out Nora made it to the surface. She'd lost a foot, but she'd made it. She'd been airlifted out and the entry was sealed. They tried to get another diving team, but there was no one else around. If they'd had more time, they'd have flown out another crew of four from Minnesota. I was down there for a total of 9 hours and 37 minutes. I had to sign a contract not to speak about this for 10 years. That time is up and now I'm telling you what I know. 
Garrett died down there, and Nora was permanently maimed. I like to consider myself lucky, but I didn't come out of this unscathed either. I don't want to go into detail, but there are wounds not easily seen as a missing foot. That space was bought by this investment company called Hatchet. I'm pretty sure they're still operating there today. I've seen the chain-linked fences and the warning signs, not to mention the armed guards. I've since moved on from diving. I can barely swim in a pool anymore. And honestly, I'm fine with that. We're almost there, guys. Just a couple more minutes. Lindsay was in the front passenger seat, looking back at us with a gleam of excitement in her eyes as the car bumped and rattled its way down the old gravel road. I read nervously from my handwritten notes, talking about our destination as the park drew closer. Burying my nose in books was a defense mechanism I had when I was anxious. I'd ramble about facts and figures when nobody else was interested. Tonight, though, everyone was listening closely in ominous silence. Clowntown Amusement Park closed since October 31st, 1997, partially as a result of the general public's growing disinterest in clowns. Admission steadily declined over a three-year period until the owner, Milton Werbach, declared bankruptcy and locked the gates for good. We've been driving for the last six hours to reach the place, and the dashboard clock read 3 a.m. Everyone in the car was too exhausted from the drive to interrupt me, so they just listened quietly to my rambling. The moon was full in the sky above, giving the night an eerie feeling. The place employed more clowns and jugglers than almost any other single location in North America. I guess a few of them had nowhere to go after the park shut down, so several of them just hung around the remains of the place, squatting on the land and claiming it as their own. They even put up new signs reading, Welcome to Clown Town, with the official population listed after that, as if it were a real town. Sightings of these squatter clowns persisted until September 20th, 2015, when police raided the park, arresting nearly a dozen former park employees, many of them still dressed in tattered clown costumes. They locked everything more securely, installed barbed wire fencing, and reinforced steel gates at the entry, but no one has maintained the property or tried to sell it. Rumor has it the Warback family is afraid to put it on the market, maybe because certain parties want to keep it as is, as if there are certain occupants who want to keep Clown Town from themselves. Yo, that is so creepy, Noel said from the driver's seat. Yo, if the police raids happened here in 2015, those guys would definitely be out of jail by now. I wonder if they came straight back here. I could tell he was freaked out, but since he was three years older than all of us, he didn't have much choice other than to act brave and pretend like he wasn't worried. Hey, thanks again for driving us out here, Noel. Look, I know you're not really into urban exploration as much as we are, but it's really fun, you'll see. Yeah, no worries. Just remember, you're all pitching in for gas on the way home, my older brother said from the driver's seat. I nodded, telling him I had a 20 in my wallet with his name on it. There it is, my friend Brett said from the back seat next to me. Look. The silhouette of an old wooden roller coaster stood out against the bloated orange moon hanging low in the sky. As we stopped the car outside the entrance, the four of us got out and looked up at the massive gate which was locked, preventing us from exploring further. The giant gate was made to look like the face of a grinning cartoon clown, except the paint was flaking and algae-colored in places, making him appear gap-toothed, faded green, and plague-ridden. A sound of movement could be heard beyond that, but it stopped abruptly as if whoever was making that sound had heard us coming. Then, in the far distance, I thought I heard a giggling sound, like laughter, but I wasn't quite sure. After it continued for a full minute uninterrupted, I chalked it up to the wind. Yeah, are you sure we should be going in there? Noel asked, looking really nervous now. It's fine, we do this kind of thing all the time. In the far distance, I thought I heard a giggling sound, like laughter, but I wasn't sure. After it continued for a full minute uninterrupted, I chalked it up to the wind. Yeah, are you sure we should be going in there? Noel asked, looking really nervous now. It's fine, we do this kind of thing all the time. Come on, pop the trunk, I'll grab the gear. My brother opened up the trunk and I took out my backpack filled with urban exploration gear. 
bolt cutters, water, rations, and a first aid kit. Not to mention a map of the park I'd found online. A giant statue of a grinning clown riding a unicycle and juggling greeted us just inside the gates. Beyond that was an empty stone water fountain and a ring of concessions all around, creating a large circular area like a courtyard, at the center of which was a large dry water fountain. All the shops were boarded and empty as we walked deeper into the park, heading towards the midway and the roller coasters. We didn't have any real plan, at least not yet. Our only real goal was to explore the abandoned park, but now that we were here, we were just wandering aimlessly looking for something cool. We reached the midway and walked past a carousel and a fun house, a tilt-a-whirl and a salt and pepper shaker ride. There was an old pirate ship ride and lots of different concession stands and restaurants as we explored, going deeper and deeper into the quiet heart of the amusement park. There was garbage and debris littered everywhere, burnt out light bulbs and broken windows, but still I could imagine what the place had been like when it was open. It felt alive somehow, as if the spirit of Clown Town had never truly left. And that scared the hell out of me. You hear that? Brett asked from beside me, looking over his shoulder nervously. No, what? Sounded like footsteps. Are you sure you didn't hear anything? I shook my head and we kept walking. Noel and Lindsay were up ahead of us. The two of them were talking and didn't seem to have heard anything either. As we kept moving toward a ferris wheel up ahead, I heard the sound Brett had mentioned. There were soft, squeaking footsteps coming from behind us. Someone was following us. And it sounded like they were wearing big, floppy, squeaking clown shoes. Grabbing Brett's arm, I ran up ahead to tell Noel and Lindsay. There's someone here. Somebody's following us, I said when I'd caught up with them. Let's get the hell out of here. Before they could say anything, I heard a sound like a light bulb breaking from behind us. We all turned to look in that direction, but saw nothing except darkness. The four of us froze in horrified silence, waiting. Then another breaking glass sound came from the right, and then the left. We stood huddled where we were, listening to the sounds from all around us of breaking light bulbs, each one being smashed from a slightly different direction, as if we were surrounded by dozens of people. The full moon provided enough illumination that we hadn't used our flashlights up until this point, but now I pulled mine out and shone it in the direction of a sound like glass breaking underfoot. A few feet away in a narrow alley, I saw the silhouette of a clown creeping up on us in the darkness. When the glow of my flashlight hit his face, he hissed and ducked away, his eyes reflecting the light like mirrors. He disappeared behind the nearest concession stand, but terrifying afterimage of him remained in my memory. His faded, ripped clown costume, his grinning face painted with soot and blood, feces, who knew what else? What the fuck was that? I screamed. A second later, I heard a scurrying sound like movement from even closer near my feet. I spun around and shone my flashlight into the shadows, but there was nothing. The sound came again from the other side, and I turned and caught sight of a small, emaciated clown his clothes tattered and torn. He was almost naked except for a dog collar and a few scraps of filthy clothing, which were covered in red polka dots. He was moving on all fours like a feral dog, snapping his teeth and barking at us. Yeah, let's get the hell out of here, Noel yelled, and we started to run as fast as we could away from there, the yipping clown dog chasing after us with more speed than I would have ever thought possible. At first I thought someone would stop us in our tracks, that there would be someone on the cobblestone path blocking our way, but there wasn't. We escaped the midway area and I felt a horrible stitch begin to grow on my side as we bolted from that section, heading back towards the entrance gate. I kept taking sideways glances at every corner, wincing at every movement caused by a gust of wind, at every sound of crunching glass underfoot, horrified of what was chasing us in the shadows. Oh, why did you bring me here? My brother was screaming. I hate clowns! The moment he said that, all of the lights in the park turned on at once. Carnival music began to play, distorted, and slowing down and speeding up intermittently. Light bulbs glowed over bright and popped as we ran past, showering us with glass and sparks. As we turned the corner, we found ourselves in the courtyard at the entrance. A giant cobblestone circle surrounded a fountain with the juggling clown statue at its head. Shops and concession stands surrounded this courtyard and we ran past them towards the gate, where we had cut a hole in the fence just next to the entrance. 
but as we approached, we saw shapes beginning to emerge from the shadows all around. They stepped out from the stores in which they had been hiding and revealed themselves. Dozens upon dozens of clowns in ragged, tattered clothing. Their faces were painted with makeup that was crusted, flaky, and peeling with age. A few of them brandished knives. Others held pieces of a rebar, rusted pipes, and broken bottles. We told you not to come back here, one of them said. We're not leaving this place. This place is ours. The four of us were only teenagers, but I realized in our dark clothing, with our faces drenched in shadow, that we looked like cops to them. Coupled with the fact that from what we had witnessed so far, they were severely mentally unstable, it didn't seem like we would be able to convince them otherwise. They thought we were here working for the police, maybe even doing reconnaissance for another raid. I pulled down my hood, revealing my face. We're not cops, we're just kids. I'm sorry, we were just looking around. Please, we'll go. At least, that's what I wanted to say. But the words caught in my throat as the clowns began to come toward us from all angles. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. And then all hell broke loose. One of them came up behind Brett with a knife in his hand. I looked over to see a giggling, emaciated clown sawing gleefully at his throat with the blade. He held back Brett's head and a fountain of blood shot out, erupting into the air. The clown stuck at his tongue and caught drops of red like snowflakes, before turning to me next. He licked the blade and began to swing at me. As I ducked and dove out of the way of the clown's knife strikes, I felt sharp stings where the steel found my skin through the dark clothing I wore. The adrenaline dulled the pain, but I would find later that the cuts went very deep. Noel and Lindsay were fighting off a couple of their own attackers, both large, vacant-eyed jesters with torn red and black clown outfits covered in a myriad assortment of rips, patches, and tears. Brett was bleeding out on the ground, looking pale with his lips starting to turn blue, as his blood ran out and formed a spreading puddle around his body. His hands had been up at his neck, clutching the gaping wound there. But now they fell limply to his sides, and I saw he was no longer breathing. "'You're next!' said the clown nearest me, seeing my eyes looking down at my best friend's dead body. "'You killed him.' I said, unable to look away from the blood and from his pale, lifeless face. He attacked me again with the knife. I was ready for him, though. In the few moments I'd been able to rest, I had pulled the heavy bolt cutters from my bag. They weighed around ten pounds and were made of hard steel. As he lunged at me with the knife, I spun with all the force I could muster, corkscrewing my body and swinging the bolt cutters like a baseball bat. The exposed steel end of them made a sickening sound like a porcelain dish full of meat being broken. The clown's teeth exploded from his mouth in a spray of blood and he fell hard to the ground, unmoving. Run! I screamed as the rest of the inhabitants of Clown Town stood gaping at the heaped remains of their leader. The rest of us darted towards the fence, only to find the way blocked by a hulking, six-and-a-half-foot-tall clown with hard, mean-looking eyes. He carried a giant monkey wrench which he slapped against his palm menacingly, stomping toward us from the shadows. Suddenly the barbed wire atop the fence didn't look nearly as intimidating as it had before. Noel, Lindsay, and I raced for the chain-link fence near to our right and started to climb, just as the crushing mob of clowns surrounded us at the bottom. The rusted steel barbs cut into my skin painfully as I climbed over the fishhook steel coils at the top. My clothes got stuck and my flesh did as well, but I just pulled and tore myself free. Not thinking of the consequences, only needing to get away from that place. Away from those horrible, terrifying clowns. I dropped down hard on the other side, eating a face full of dirt and knocked my teeth out of alignment. Pulling myself up quickly, racing for the car at the other side of the road, I felt blood pouring from my mouth and from a dozen other wounds all over my body. By the time we got inside our vehicle, we were almost surrounded by them again, as they poured out through the hole in the fence we had made. They were bloodthirsty and angry, wanting revenge for their dead leader. As the car reluctantly started, they banged on the hood and smashed the windows, trying to pull us out to face our punishment. Noel slammed his foot down hard on the gas and we drove off at the last possible moment, looking back in shocked horror at the group of them standing in the road. None of us said anything for a while. We just drove, panting and terrified, 
covered in sweat and blood, fresh bruises and wounds that will last a lifetime. And we were the lucky ones. So take this as a warning. Don't ever visit the abandoned amusement park called Clown Town. It was closed for a reason. My town is a lesion on the hide of Great Britain. It's the sort of place that might be pleasant if it weren't in the north of England, and had completely different people. But it is, and it doesn't, so... You know, rubbish. For years, the only truly redeeming feature of Yeastwick was the new Tesco, a grocery store to the Yanks. The new Tesco isn't actually new, and for the past decade it hasn't been. But when the old one burned down in a satanic ritual gone horribly as expected, and they built a new one up atop the ashes, the name seemed appropriate. It stuck because the new Tesco is more exciting than the Tesco, I think, maybe. The reason the new Tesco was great can be captured by a common enough exchange. All right, Mick, I might say. Tommy, how's the family? Mick might respond. Mom's drunk, Dad's dead, Beck's pregnant and 17. Right, Mick might add, laconically. I'm nicking a Heineken and a Maltesers. Nicking equals stealing. Right. Well, don't get caught drink driving. Fantastic, right? I love Mick to death. He's like a dad I could love to life. But Mick hates his job. I've never met a man so completely committed to getting sacked who nonetheless doesn't. It's really gotten to the point of vocational parody. And I am absolutely not discounting the possibility that Mick is a hostage of the Tesco Corporation. He has a traffic sort of despondency about him. But when he's not working, he's usually getting pissed down at the gift horse. That's a pub. Anyway, like I said, the new Tesco was a quality den of minor villainy. Now it's... I'm not so sure. A temple to surrealist fuckery, maybe? And it's got everything to do with a dodgy fucking antelope that appeared one day like a nasty whitehead in the hard cartilage of the town's ear. But the town, being the open sore that it is, actually welcomed the bougie deer. Mental. That brings me to Remy and the kebab cart he moved into the front of the Tesco. Remy's French. His surname's Lacroix. Remy Lacroix. Like the hula-hooping porn star queen of the beleaguered look-back. And until the new Tesco decided to get weird, he sold spliffs out of his Volkswagen and made subversive YouTube videos about why no one should drink oat milk. Rennie's a bloody vegan, so how surprised was I to see him shaving lamb donair off a spit like a fucking professional? I was with Algy and Rosie when I first saw the meaty new addition. In any other town, the three of us might be rightly considered a street gang, but in Yeastwick, we're just irksome youths who were raised by ordinary, negligent parents. Algy's short for Algernon, a posh name for a morally impoverished man. Rosie's fit and a bit of a slag, but she's excellent people, and she can put back a pint with the best of them. Algy stared at Remy's cart with more confusion than could be normally found on his lovely brickish face, and then he asked the question that the rest of us were thinking. Who'd you stab to get the cart? Remy smiled pleasantly, which was off-putting in a way I can't put words to. Oh, I did not steal it. It was a gift. From the council. Unfucking likely For anyone not from the UK... How nice for you, but also, a council is basically like a, a local government. In practice, it's like a pay toilet with a broken door. It takes your money, it obstructs your pursuit of bliss, and it's typically full of shit. They don't give out kebab carts. And they certainly don't give them to drug-dealing vegan Frenchmen. Mm, but why? Rosie asked Remy, quite Socratically. Remy waved at a sullen mother and a noisy child as they entered the store, and then he returned to the question at hand. Uh, to make room for the antelope. The antelope? Now, I don't speak French, and Remy says things like, That night we take the MDNA was so funny. Which means he took and fun, but he had something wrong. An antelope is like a deer, mate. I said with just a whisper of snark. Oh, no, no. It is much better than that. You will see. He kept smiling, quite a bit like Buddha, really, which did the work of convincing me that Remy was just high on something. Algy noticed, too. You taking something new, like some French hallucinogen? 
Is it good? Have a taster for us? Algy was a bit thick, but he knew how to ask an important question. However, Remy said he was sober, which seemed a bit of a stretch. But he was smiling. Maybe he had found Jesus. Or maybe Jesus had found him. Or maybe his new French hallucinogen really was good and had convinced him that he was a kebabist. I had settled on the latter, possibly, as we got to the refrigerator. And then I saw something strange. It was filled with nothing but cat. Is that grass? I mean, it was filled with nothing but grass. Rosie was right, and I needed to take a break from Eritrean off-duty shops. But more devastatingly, Rosie was right. Grass. Long fucking bundles of chilled grass. Like the type you would find in a field, but not the sort Remy sold. I was perplexed, unnerved, and I suspected that Mick had finally lost it, so I went to stage an intervention. Mick. Thomas. Thomas. What the fuck was happening? You, Mick, are a beautiful lunatic, but a lunatic all the same, I accused, pointing a finger perhaps more menacingly than was warranted. But this is too fucking much, mate. Tommy... Rosie started in, but I was too incensed to be polite and respond. Where is the beer, Mick? Grass? Fucking grass? I, uh, found a 1664, Algy offered in. But Tommy... Cronenberg 1664? French piss. I fucking screamed, and the noisy child from earlier heard and got more noisy. The sullen mum, though, total babe, went startled instead of dour. I cracked a cheeky grin. She frowned. My miserable weariness hardened like concrete around my head. Stop smiling pleasantly, Mick. I'm in a crisis here, and I cannot change my lifestyle if you get sectioned. Bloody fucking grass? Wait, why did everyone seem so happy? Why was hot mom putting grass in her shopping trolley? Why was noisy child so quiet all of a sudden? Had I finally succumbed to mental illness the way my dad always said I would, before he was mauled to death by that improbable Barbary lion? My mind felt mired in the possibility. Tommy! Algy and Rosie shouted together. What? Rosie looked shaken, and Algy was holding a now half-empty 1664, clearly beside himself with grief. It's all grass. Or mostly, Rosie squeaked. I disembarked from my tirade long enough to actually look at my surroundings. Once again, she was right. Aisles were stacked haphazardly with bunches and bundles of grass. The floors were littered with the leavings of it. And I watched in disgust as a man in a flat cap sniffed a blade, nibbled, and made a face as if to say, mm, That'll do nicely in Marjorie's stew. The new Tesco was now a hostile place. I noticed that as Algy said, Gift horse? Rosie nodded eagerly. Oh god, yes. And I sunk in sour mourning over a once great institution of our terribly wanting community. Any grass for you lot, then? Mick asked finally without a dry fucking gram of humor. I grumbled, and then I passive-aggressively grabbed the only sweet I could find on the way out. A lion bar. And they always reminded me of my dad in a not-so-good way. It was a haunting treat, but in the moment not nearly as haunting as any fucking grass for you lot. Jesus Christ. By the time we got to the gift horse, I was thirsty and huffing and possibly dangerous. Things only got worse when I saw the sign that hung over the door. Someone had gouged away the word horse and sloppily painted antelope over it in bright red letters. Fuck me. Rosie refused to enter, which was probably smart, but Algy and I were brave for her. I left her my lion bar wrapper so she wouldn't feel abandoned. She started in on a Marlboro, the first of many, I suspected and Algy and I entered, quite prepared to do violence if it came to that. Whatever I was expecting of the gift antelope, it certainly wasn't a usually rowdy bunch of drunkards and reprobates dressed like one and all were angling for a place of high esteem with a local vicarage. They were still loud, still watching football, but their kit was just... bizarre. Do us three loggers, Nige, Algy said, leaning his work-horsey frame on the bar. Nigel, the barman, pulled three elegantly predictable pints, though a bit more clumsily than usual. After, he took Algy's money, but I swear he almost looked relieved, even with Algy being short 20p. Uh, no milk, then? Nigel asked. Fucking what? 
Pardon, did you say milk? I asked, feeling a spasm jerk my face into what I assumed was an ugly look. Babies drink milk, Nigel. And when have you ever... Nigel suddenly swept his eyes down the bar and I followed them. The drunkards, the church boy reprobates, they were, to a man, cradling pints of ever so slightly greenish milk. It turned my stomach. A tap in the ribs from algae turned my eyes. He mouthed, What the fuck? And I was right there with him. This was either the world's most elaborate wind-up or our town had well and truly lost its mind. Nigel, what's with the antelope sign? Algy asked uneasily, and as if competing with Algy for who could pull the most distressing facial expression, Nigel's face chose haggard fear. This time, his eyes darted to the patron nearest me, a man called Stephen, whom everyone called the Duchess instead. I turned my head slowly toward him and found him grinning cartoonishly at me and Algy. I can't stress how shit this town is usually. People don't smile. It was a jarring thing to see so much in one day. All right, Dutch. He cut me off. The antelope is a fine, majestic creature, isn't it, Thomas? Such power and grace as it bounds and prances through the fields. Some antelope eat meat. And their regal horns are often mistaken for nature's... This time I cut him off. Shut your fucking mouth, Duchess. He didn't. I punched him hard in the nose. He started bleeding like his face was the trevi fountain of a nasal injury, but just kept yammering on like David Bloody Attenborough about how great antelopes were. And then I realized that the murmur of background conversation was all antelope talk. They pondered aloud about whether there was a best way to brush an antelope, whether an antelope forward on Man City might make the team more resplendent, whether it might be possible for a man to be born of an antelope mother and walk unknown amongst the world of disgusting humanity, and then abruptly with chilling synchronicity. They all went silent. A moment later, they began to hum. Mm -hmm. I turned to Algy, who had finished his pint and was on to mine. Algy looked frightened, but Algy was looking at Nigel, and Nigel looked terrified. Nigel had fought in the army. Nigel had once thrown a bottle of brandy at a man who tried to rob him, and then set the man ablaze using a votive candle. Nigel wore an almost Prussian mustache that made him look like a man who could sort any problem with a headbutt in a cold glare of stony masculinity. But as the patrons hummed, Nigel raised his right arm above the bar, and I saw the reason for his earlier clumsiness. Nigel was right-handed. Or, he had been. Now he had a stump at the wrist, wrapped in a blood-soaked tea towel. Nigel? I exhaled before inhaling a long and quite unsettled silence. Nigel was looking to the door, pale as a ghost and nearly as insubstantial. And then I heard a scream outside. My eyes shot to Algy, whose own eyes had followed the same instinct. We shared a silent exchange. Rosie, Algy's eyes suggested. Indeed, my eyes agreed. Then, with a shifting for a brow, I conveyed. But the danger. Nigel's missing hand. He seems scared. Luckily, I typically carried a knife. This day was a typical one, at least in that regard. I brought it out. Algy armed himself with a wooden stool, and once again I thought morosely of my dad. Then Algy nodded in a way that might have been resolute, if not for the panic. I nodded back. And then for about twenty seconds we joined each other in what might be best described as tribalistic hyperventilation. Let's go get our girl, Algy murmured like the quiet hero that he was. I gripped my knife handle tightly and tried to look mean instead of deeply worried. Then Algy kicked the pub door open and we stormed into the street and... Fuck. Rosie, no! Algy screamed, dropping a stool and running towards the remains of a body in the street. Three twisted limbs, two legs and an arm, were the only recognizable parts of a headless corpse, whose torso looks like a mince pie ten seconds into a starving man's meal. I looked away, down at my feet, and jumped to the side as my gaze found the other arm. Algy was openly weeping, trying to scoop bits of human gore back together, as if the death and mutilation of our friend was something that could be fixed. 
But then I noticed something as my eyes once again found the severed arm. The tattoos were wrong. So were the bracelets on the wrist. Rosie? I shouted. I heard no answer but began to meander about brandishing my knife like the stinger of an angry wasp. Then I yelled to Algy. It's not her. The tattoos are wrong. Algy curiously lifted the arm nearest him by its middle finger and studied it. And then he looked back at me as the threadbare relief washed over his snotty, tear-jerked face. And then I saw surprise and joy as he stood and trundled over toward a spot to my right. Rosie had been hiding near a hedge that ran along the front of the pub, clever girl that she was. And Rosie chirped as Algy lifted her off the ground in a rib-straining hug. Only Rosie didn't seem to share Algy's exuberance. She hung limply from his arms and stared off into the distance. I looked at the mangled body in the street. It hadn't been Rosie, but Rosie must have seen it happen. And whatever had happened didn't seem like the sort of thing that a moment of happy reunion would allow her to unsee. Oh, poor Rosie, I thought. But with our band of miscreants reunited and physically safe, if psychologically battered, we fled the scene as quickly as our legs would take us. We made for Rosie's flat as it was the closest. And once inside, I put a kettle on as Algy tried to amuse the trauma out of Rosie. It took quite a while, but she drank tea well enough, and afterward, we moved feverishly quickly to a mostly full bottle of peppermint schnapps and a half-smoked spliff. It was only with a healthy dose of toothpasty cordial and cannabis in her, and the comfort blanket of an unopened packet of cigarettes that she began to talk. It was this thing. The, the antelope, maybe, that did it. She said, her hands shaking the flame of her lighter into a disorderly cigarette ember. I saw Mary Conover walking the street, and I, I thought her dress looked rather smart, and then that thing rounded a corner and came up behind her, quiet-like. Mary Conover, Algy sighed. I always fancied her. I thought I had a chance, too. Aw, babes, Rosie responded. You definitely did. Algy smiled half-drunkenly, and we raised a toast to Mary before Rosie continued with her grisly tale that now felt strangely heartwarming. I don't know how tall an antelope is meant to be, but this one had legs as long as Algy's body, and it almost looked like it was tiptoeing on its tiny little feet, like it was sneaking. I called Mary's name, and she turned, and, and then she saw it and, and screamed. Rosie swallowed another draught of schnapps. It's weird. As much as an animal can, this one seemed almost disappointed when Mary realized it was there. And then it kind of trod on her. As, as soon as she fell, it lowered herself down and started chomping on her belly. After she finished, no one spoke. We drank and smoked in silence, each of us trying to make sense of what was happening through a mercifully thickening haze of intoxication. We all slept at Rosie's that night. I was the little spoon, Rosie the middle one, and Algy the big. But my sleep was plagued by a recurring series of disconcertingly antelopian dreams. In them, I was an antelope, grazing in a field of wiggling fingers and bushes made of human hair. I felt the weariness of an antelope, the fear of predators, and the hunger that, when sated, kept me sane. I shit where I stood and occasionally had disturbingly horny thoughts of antelope sex. And then a panic rang through the herd like a stiff breeze. There was a lion nearby. I knew it, and an antelope beside me that I knew to be my dad in the dream logic sort of way knew it too. When the lion bolted out from a nearby thicket of swaying human legs, I ran. But my dadalope tripped, and the lion got him. When I awoke, I did my best to shake off a lingering hunger for grass and told no one about my nocturnal insanity. And then together we resolved to go back to the pub and save Nigel. He seemed unaffected by the town's obsession with antelopes, and he was a good bloke that we had heartlessly abandoned. And he had a missing hand, which we all agreed may be the sort of thing that might require a doctor. So with what armaments could be scavenged from Rosie's flat, we set out on a mission of valor, or that was the idea. Our middling courage was quickly stifled as we walked out the front door and heard, hmm. 
The humming began right after the door opened. A moment later, we saw the source. The whole bloody town seemed to be gathered in the street in front of Rosie's flat, all of them completely nude, staring blankly toward the sky and swaying gently with their arms stretched into the air. Algy put on a bewildered, gargoyle-ish scowl, and Rosie whispered, What the fuck? Are they trying to be... Because they almost look like... Grass. They almost look like grass. I shivered despite myself, and I tried not to delve into the implications of this mass hysteric piece of performance art. I needed to retain a scrap of boldness for the benefit of my friends, and for our wayward barman. So I swallowed my considerable unease, and we headed into the throng of human vegetation. In truth, it wasn't entirely dissimilar from moving through the front bit of a concert, vast numbers of exposed willies and fannies notwithstanding. The humming persisted, though, growing louder the deeper we went, and with all the upstretched arms, it almost felt as though we weren't meant to see or hear our surroundings. Buildings loomed along our flanks, but the street ahead was a complete fucking mystery, and I was less than thrilled. Then the whispers began. Near enough to be heard, but swallowed into obscurity by the sheer number of possible sources. The humming ebbed, and a voice said, We are grass. We are heard. The next utterance was the same, but it had the addition of a few more voices. We are grass. We are heard. The frequency of the voices increased as we neared the pub. The humming began to subside, and it was perhaps 200 feet from the pub that I saw the first pair of severed legs on the ground. Blood clung to the naked bodies nearby. Next, there was a loop of entrails hanging from the shoulder of a woman called Penny Wentworth. I didn't see a body to go along with it. We are grass. We are herd. We are grass. We are herd. We are grass. We are herd. The chorus of voices began to repeat the chant incessantly, and then we saw the sign for the pub. There was another new edition scrawled in messy red paint. For the... Gift for the antelope. We hurried inside. Algy made for the bar. Rosie lit a cigarette, and I looked out the window. I wish I hadn't. I wish the field of human grass had remained an innocuous strangeness, albeit one peppered with bits of gore. But as I looked outside, I saw no more raised arms. They were all facing the pub. Dozens of faces all frozen in the same terror-stricken grimace. Guys... I said, strafing in front of the window and watching as scores of panicked eyes followed my movements. Tommy? Rosie said from behind me. There's something wrong with Nigel. There's something wrong with bloody everyone, Rosie. I replied. But I shut the blinds on the pub's front window and turned around at Rosie's urging. As always, Rosie was right. Algy was standing, tightly wound, a few feet from the bar back and clutching a bottle of whiskey. His priorities, as per usual, were in line with the welfare of our trio, but he looked decidedly out of sorts as he gazed behind the bar at Nigel. Nigel was on the floor atop a sprawling, nearly familiar phrase painted in large, messy red letters. We are grass. We are heard. Beyond the revelatory, homophonic clarity, there was Nigel's unnerving theatrics. He was naked, scampering about behind the bar on all threes and occasionally stopping to lick paint or puddles of clotted milk from the floor. As if that weren't enough, he or one of the patrons had stapled two crumpled paper cones to his forehead. Horns. Nigel was an antelope now, and well beyond our help, it seemed. We should go, Rosie said shakily, melancholic weariness writ large across her face. Algy was silent staring vacantly at a row of bottles as his own sloshed slightly with his heavy breaths. Things weren't going to be okay, were they? It had all happened too quickly. And as much as I wanted to find an anchor point for snark or sarcastic derision, I couldn't find one. There was only dread. Foreboding, oily dread that coated my mind like a film, evaporating latent levity as it stained my thoughts. When we left the pub, the street was empty apart from the odd body part or pool of glistening blood. 
The town was gone, the grass was nibbled, and the fearful herd had moved on. I think the silence was worse than the humming or the whispers, though the walk back to Rosie's was easier. Even so, it was slow, and every now and then I'd catch a bit of movement out of the corner of my eye. Someone sneaking, someone hiding, someone watching. We spent the next two days cloistered in Rosie's flat. The whiskey went quickly, as did a bottle of warm champagne that Rosie had been saving for some TBD special occasion. We ate what meager assortment of food she had, hobnobs and beans on toast the first day, and then crisps and packaged frozen tikka masala the second. She had Parcheesi, the royal game of India, and we played it whenever the normalcy of YouTube began to feel too surreal. Between the game and the curry, it was almost possible to believe that we were somewhere far away. And in case you're figuring me for a heartless bastard, I did try my mom and sister. Mom had changed her answer phone message to a garbled monologue of bizarre antelope trivia. A herd of antelope can survive even when only one is breathing. It is the blood of grass that gives the antelope's coat its tawny luster. Things like that. Beck's return SMS message was worse. It simply read, In my womb a grass seed grows. They were gone. Swept up in a mental sickness that we had somehow avoided. But during the first night of seclusion, the antelope dreams returned, and I worried over how long our avoidance would last. I was a fetal antelope in the dream, listening to the hum of blood around me as fingers poked and prodded my uterine enclosure. Upon awakening, the thirst for the ferric juice of flesh-cut grass lingered for hours. It was disturbing, but perhaps not as disturbing as the humming the second night, and the screams that punctuated the monotonous drone. By the third day, we were out of alcohol, nearly out of food, and Rosie's bouts of chain-smoking had dwindled her supply of Marlboros to a perilous low. It was with the grimness of a gallows goodbye that we joined her in smoking the last three. Afterwards, we would have to leave the prop safety of Rosie's flat and return to where it all started. The new Tesco. It was around half eleven when we finally did, and strangely, the prospect of leaving Rosie's one-bedroom Nom Shelter had me in a passably decent mood. Now, when the hobbits left the Shire in the first Lord of the Rings movie, I remember there being a lightness to their start. Even when they knew they were meant to take a ring to a literal hellscape, the wee fuckers at least seemed to have a modicum of bravery. Rosie retched the moment she opened the door to her flat. I heard the splatter of sick on the ground. It did not quite seem an optimal start for a short walk to the greengrocer. For my part, I had close to no expectation about what we'd find outside. It wasn't a bloody safari into the people part plains of northern England, and it certainly didn't include my very pregnant and entirely too naked sister crouched with a half dozen others around a wide pool of blood. Are they... licking that? Algy asked, swallowing the unpleasantness of the sight halfway through the question. Rosie took a break from spitting on the ground to add, It's almost like a watering hole. Like on the telly. It was exactly like that. I called Beck's name. She didn't respond. But she was alive and safe enough for now, I told myself. I'd be back for her. I'd find out why all this was happening, and then I'd get someone more suitable than myself to fix it. But for the time being, we trudged. From what I could gather, the people of Yeastwick had arranged themselves into two flavors of lunacy. There were antelopes, like my sister, and, and there were blades of grass. Many of the blades of grass seemed to have missing parts, or what looked like bite marks on their thighs and calves. Some had clearly lost too much blood and simply wriggled on the ground instead of swaying. But there were no whole corpses nearby, only parts. I don't know if I had become numb to the carnage or what, but I found myself significantly more disturbed by one consuming thought. Where was the antelope? By the time we had gotten to the new Tesco, I still hadn't seen it, but I could hear Rosie's story just fine as it played through my mind. It almost looked like it was tiptoeing on its tiny little feet. Like it was sneaking. The dodgy deer was just getting dodgier as my paranoia pursued me like its bloody shadow. Algy spotted Remy's Volkswagen in the car park in front of the shop. I'm going to break his window and nick his stash, he said. I don't want to die sober, and I mean, it might be good to have a car. 
Algy was so wise. And also, he was right about the car thing. We shared a group hug, and then a round of bonding screams. And then we said a bit of mushy rubbish that is and shall ever be a secret. And so, bolstered by the power of love and friendship, Rosie and I held our weapons firmly and proceeded towards our possible doom. Remy greeted us with a cheery, Bienvenue. Rosie responded with a curt but incredulous, No. I responded with an irate, You are fucking joking, you mental French twat. He was standing at his kebab cart, and he wasn't acting like an antelope, but he was bloody well dressed like one. Where in the fuck does one even find an antelope onesie, Remy? Tell me now, or I will turn you into fucking grass. He smiled in a perplexed sort of way and answered, Quoi? Tu n'as pas d'encens? French bullshit. He and Cronenberg, 1664, were cut from the same bloody cloth, and if it hadn't been for his meat knife being bigger than mine, I might have done something gruesome. He said you're not making sense, Tommy, Rosie said in a quite surprising comprehension of French. She really was amazing, and Remy really was a twat. I really needed to talk to Mick, so with a practically historical amount of Anglo-French animosity boiling up in my stabbing hand, I stormed off in search of my replacement father figure. I found him in his office in the back, a place I wasn't entirely sure he even knew about. But in this particular quiet rampage through the shop, I actually took note of my surroundings. Much of the literal grass had been replaced with figurative grass. Arms and legs and heaped innards and even a tidy display of heads where the lettuce were usually kept. The latter seemed perversely comical. The lack of beer did not. Mick, explain! I shouted as I found Mick drawing a surprisingly good picture of an antelope riding a nude man like a horse. Hey, Thomas! How lovely of you to visit! Shopping for grass, then? I am not an antelope. I'm a man. I do not eat grass. I eat chips and sausage rolls and lager. None of which you seem to have, because you have seemingly set out to exclusively sell ghoulish fucking nightmares. Mick seemed to consider this for a moment before responding. You seem tense, Thomas. Perhaps a bit of trivia might lighten your mood. He handed me a piece of paper covered in shockingly pleasant calligraphy. Mick's top ten facts about antelopes. I read the list. Not one of his facts seemed remotely plausible. But his penmanship was stellar and the list was a gift, so I folded the paper as I glowered at Mick and placed it into my pocket. Mick, I had no idea you were so artistic! I shouted out of pure residual rage. But what the fuck is the antelope and why are you filling the shop with people parts? Mick chuckled coyly. The antelope is a valued customer, Thomas. And a cheeky bit of gossip for you. He might be a secret shopper. To truly understand, you'll need a bit of backstory. The year was 1753, and in Bristol... Mick's psychotic ramble was interrupted by a scream from inside the shop. I surged into action. Tommy! Rosie shouted. I'm coming, Ro- Oh, what the fuck? I tore out of the back office in time to see an abomination that might, in extremely loose terms, be called an antelope, but it was crawling from an open ceiling panel like a bloody spider. Rosie had been bang on about the leg length, but what she had neglected to mention was how decomposed the mangy creature was. Its missing patches of fur and skin gave way to swatches of gangrenous flesh, and the skin of its head was almost entirely rotten away to the bone. As I crossed the shop toward the front, I saw the antelope drop down to an aisle. Then, as I turned a corner and made for Rosie, I saw it settling into a shopping trolley. It began to push the thing forward with its spindly legs, and I wondered for a moment if Something like this was just an inevitability for a place like Eastwick. And then I saw Remy, with his meat knife resting on Rosie's throat like a bow of a bloody cello. He was smiling. The shopping trolley squeaked toward us, and I tried to think of a way to stab Rosie to safety. Not finding an obvious course, I opted for diplomacy. Remy, you fuck. You're a vegan. This is assuredly not in line with your core beliefs, right? He furrowed his brow. A vegan? No. I am an antelope. We are herd. unbe fucking leaveable I couldn't stab Remy because he'd kill Rosie. I couldn't leave Rosie because she was a mate. I probably couldn't kill the antelope because 
already seemed pretty dead. So I was going to be eaten by an antelope in a shopping trolley in the new bloody Tesco because of the portrayal of a kebab-catering not-vegan Frenchman in an animal onesie. It was a preposterous way to die, and as I glared back at my approaching executioner, I had a preposterous notion. I rounded on the antelope. Hey, you fucking thing. Why are you here, and what the fuck do you want? The antelope squeaked to a stop a few feet away from me and inhaled a long, rattling breath. And then it spoke. With an East London accent. I'm here because deer and horses aren't the only scary animals, it said. What the fuck did that mean? You are a deer. An exotic one, maybe. A dodgy one, certainly. But a deer, mate, through and through. It only had one eye, a milky, deadish sort, but I swear it was judging me. Some would differ on that point, mate. I narrowed my eyes at it. I was not going to be out-snarked by a monster. Not today, and not in the new Tesco. Perhaps this sort of thing might have gone over in the old Tesco. The old Tesco. Oh, I remembered its emolition and began to connect some dots, which brought another notion forward. Perhaps a less preposterous one than the last. Are you like a... a demon? I asked. The antelope shifted in the trolley. No. I momentarily turned back to Rosie, who seemed thoroughly confused quite frightened and just a touch entertained. Remy still looked like a twat. Well then, why all the eating people? And people worshipping you, and... Why am I still me and when they aren't? I asked. Well, sometimes antelopes eat meat. Your kind follow me because antelopes are interesting and scary. And you were allowed to roam free because you were already an antelope. You have in your blood a story of lion-related trauma... That reverberates through time and marks your soul with the collective anxiety of the herd. Uh, what the fuck's going on? A familiar voice called. I turned to see Algy behind me, eyes bouncing between Remy and the antelope. Algy, things got weird. Weirder, I said, trying to project confidence. And Remy, put down that damn knife, you twat. You heard the monster. I'm basically an antelope chosen one. Remy shrugged and lowered the knife. Rosie turned and kneed him in the groin, and he doubled over. Then Rosie asked a question I hadn't considered in my egotistical pursuit of truth. Why were Algy and I allowed to roam free? I turned back to the antelope who sat motionless and stared for a long moment. Ron and Hermione, isn't it? What the absolute fuck? This monster ate Mary Conover. It turned the town into a hellish blood parade. It made me see my sister naked, and it was making Harry Potter jokes. For the second time in a week, I screamed in the new Tesco, and then I did something unwise. I stabbed the antelope in its milk eye. The antelope let out a rasping chuckle, and then it lowered its head and lurched forward. Fuck. I remember looking down at the horn lodged in my abdomen and thinking, Ugh, my dad was killed by a lion. Now I've been killed by an antelope. Where does it end? And then, as everything went black, all I could think of was that song, The Circle of Life. You know, the one from The Lion King. But I didn't die. I awoke from a sleep utterly devoid of antelopian dreams in a hospital bed. Algy was snoring in a chair, and Rosie was reading a book. And after a triumphant celebration, including a cheeky Heineken, Rosie passed me a folded piece of paper. Mix beautifully penned antelope rubbish. I've read it, Rosie, I said. There's more on the back, she responded. I think Mick just reused the paper. I flipped it over and saw a note written in what looked like blood. Dear Lucifer, I am the manager of a Tesco in Yeastwick, UK. It has been a decade now since last we attempted to summon a dread emissary from your domain, the attempt at which consumed the former Tesco in a conflagration of hellfire and brimstone. But our town has gone to shit, and I believe it is due to the rise in popularity of our local vicarage and its subduing effect on our pursuit of hedonistic bliss. For that reason, I offer this blood writing and the soul of Remy Lacroix as sacrifice and pray to bring harmonious and animalistic amorality back to our town. The last time you sent a demon, it took the form of a Barbary lion, 
but I am rather partial to antelopes because they are quite interesting animals. Forever in your cursed thrall, Mick. My mind fixated on the shocking revelation. The antelope lied to me. I asked if it was a demon. It said no. I thought we had a rapport before we exchanged violence, but I guess that was a lie too. What an absolute wanker. I silently resolved to never trust an antelope again. French, demonic, or otherwise. But then I continued. P.S. On another note, I was hoping that in time you might see to helping me with a personal issue. I am eternally your servant in damnation, my soul forever bound to the stone of Beelzebub, etc., etc. But for the past six years I have been a hostage of the Tesco Corporation, which I feel is interfering with my subservience to your evil machinations. Please assist at your earliest. Thanks, mate. XO, Mick. Holy shit. I fucking knew it! The passing of time is a strange thing. Uncle Mike's died, Mom told me over the phone. I was devastated, but not shocked. My great-uncle Mike had been an old man, very old indeed. He was in his mid-90s when he died. I'd only ever met him when I was a kid, so my memory of the man wasn't too clear. When my mom called me to give me the news of his death, I hadn't seen him in almost a decade. That's the reason I was so surprised to find that the old man had left something for me. It was an old, rusty metal box. I carefully opened the lid. I'm not gonna lie, I hoped he'd left me something interesting, knowing he was quite a collector. What I was greeted with was an assortment of strange items, though. The first was a black and white photograph of two people dating back to the early 30s. One of them I assumed must have been my great uncle in young years. The man next to him was quite a bit older. He had short dark hair and a scar on the left side of his face. Probably his father or another relative, I thought. I put the picture aside after a few moments. The next one was a simple postcard. It was a typical one from the German Democratic Republic depicting the world clock in Berlin. When I checked the back, the only thing written on it was the name Struganow. Why is this postcard in here? I wondered. The other items all seemed to be products of the same period. One was an old portable radio, one an old egg whisk that appeared to have been part of a hand blender, and there were a few heavy metal badges. Why was this stuff in here? Was it some sort of elaborate joke? I mean, an egg whisk, for Christ's sake? Uncle Mike had even told me that he'd never been a big fan of the era, and was more than happy when Germany reunited. The last item I found was stored away below the rest. It was an old map. When I checked the print date, it was from the late years of the Weimar Republic. This made even less sense. I took everything out of the box and searched for a note that would explain the weird collection. I found nothing. When I opened the map, I saw that it was a map of his old home area. Or better, the electoral district it used to belong to. I scanned it half-heartedly and found a few marks on it. They were all located on an empty patch of land. The longer I stared at it, the more frustrated I became. This was silly. I shook my head and put everything back in the box. I kept the box, nonetheless. Not because I thought any of the contents were particularly interesting, but as a sort of memorabilia of my late uncle. And for years, the box was merely stowed away on my shelf, collecting dust. I'd all but forgotten about its contents when I got to know Professor Newman, years later. By the time I was studying physics at university, Professor Newman was a brilliant man who wasn't shy of interacting with his students. Countless times, he and a small group of students, including me, sat together at our cafeteria. Professor Newman used to work as a researcher for the GDR, and only started teaching after the reunion. Most of us laughed a bit when he mentioned that period, and a few asked what he'd been doing at the time. Not like the GDR made any groundbreaking discoveries or developments. The old man only smiled at that. We weren't as useless as you might think, Marcus, he said to me. If we put our minds together, we were still able to do astonishing feats. The problem was that we never got enough funding. We were always stuck working with second or third grade equipment. 
Everything else the Russians took for themselves. All for the motherland, he said, grimacing. It was on another evening that I got together with the old man. He'd finished his last lecture for the day, and I'd approached him about one of the problems he'd discussed. While we walked to his office, he carefully reiterated things to me. Soon enough, he trailed off and started talking about other things. As we sat in his office, we soon got to talking about the GDR again. It seemed to be one of his favorite topics. He just told me a story about Berlin and the world clock, when I suddenly remembered the odd box my uncle had left for me. Half joking, I told him about the weird metal box on my shelf and the assortment of strange GDR things inside. The man laughed at first, but when I mentioned the items, he looked up, a serious look on his face. Wait, hold on a second. What items did you say your uncle had left in there? Uh, it's been so long, I'm, I'm not really sure. There was a, let's see, a postcard, a portable radio, a few metal badges, oh, and of course a freaking egg whisk. No clue what's up with that. An egg whisk. I nodded. Now, it might be nothing, but would you mind bringing those and showing them to me? Well, sure, no problem. It's only collecting dust anyways, but why do you want to see them? The man shook his head. It's probably nothing. I, I've just got this stupid idea on my mind, that's all. I looked at him a bit confused, but then I shrugged and let it slide. Who knows, maybe he collects odd things as well. After all, he really seems to be into this GDR era and all that. It was a few days later that I paid the professor another visit to his office. He looked up, surprised to see me, but welcomed me inside. So, what brings you here? Is it about that assignment for theoretical physics? I brought the box. You said you wanted to see the stuff my uncle collected, right? In an instant, the man changed from half asleep to excited. Oh, then don't let me wait. Let me see, let me see. I was again a bit confused by his reaction, but handed him the box. He opened the lid and then scanned the assortment of things inside. He opened up the map, scanning the area and the marks curiously before he put it back down. After a while, his eyes grew wide. It can't be, he mumbled as he took out the postcard. My god. He inhaled sharply, put his hand to his mouth, and shook his head again and again. Struganow, he whispered. What is it, Professor? The man slowly looked up as if he'd forgotten that I was even there in the room. For a moment, he looked at me but didn't say a word. H hold on, I I've got to look something up. Maybe he's still... The rest was inaudible as the man mumbled again. He seemed to be all over the place in his excitement because of... something. I waited in my chair as the professor started to go through his notebooks. He picked up the phone in his office and quickly dialed a number. It was only moments later that he put it back down cursing under his breath. Professor, what's going on? Finally, the man seemed to have calmed down a bit and took a seat in the chair again. The postcard was still laying in front of him. Back in the day, when I worked as a researcher, we did a few, well, strange experiments, you could say. It might sound like science fiction to you, but during the Cold War, Russia was interested in all sorts of weird things. And one of them was time travel. I looked up and couldn't help but laugh a bit. Yeah, see, that's exactly the reaction I'd expected. Now, don't get me wrong, I'd react exactly like you if I hadn't worked on that project back then. Uh, Alright, hold on. Are you telling me you worked on a freaking time machine for the Soviets back in the day? A smile showed on the professor's face. Exactly, but as you can imagine, it never worked. Well, at least that's what everyone believed. But this in here, these objects, I think it's the ones we used in the later experiments. What the hell was he talking about? This had to be a joke. I'd never heard the man pull one before, but there was no other way. I started laughing. <laughs> you almost got me there, Professor. Almost. No. He started shaking his head. Don't you get it? If these things are really... We have proof. I've got to tell Ivan. I've got to show him. My God, if it really... I stared at the man. This was both the lamest and the most drawn-out attempt at a joke I'd ever seen. 
The professor started to search through his many notebooks and documents again. Finally, he seemed to have found what he was looking for. I knew I had it written down somewhere, he said, grinning. What's that now? Say, Marcus, do you want to find out where those items in your box came from? It was a few days later that I found myself in a car with Professor Newman. We were on the way to his old research laboratory, the last address of his colleague, Ivan Nikolaev. I'm really not sure if we're going to find anything there. I'm sure he's returned to Russia by now, but still, the professor said. I couldn't believe that I went through with this whole thing. I'd planned to spend the weekend with my friends, and now I found myself on a road trip with my university professor. Worse yet, it was to figure out if his frickin' time machine had worked, of all things. It was ridiculous. During the four-hour-long car ride, Professor Newman explained a lot of things to me. He almost talked the entire time. He went on about politics during the time of his and Ivan's experiments. Moscow, back then, tried to desperately get ahead of America. Our project wasn't the only one of its kind. They had a lot of these weird, secret projects but I guess none of them ever brought them any results. Well, maybe one of them did after all. Too bad it's a bit late for these old Soviets. At other times he talked about the project. He tried to explain the theoretical background to me, but most of it went way over my head. By the time I was in my third semester of physics, I knew most of the terms he referred to, but didn't understand a thing about the principles he and Ivan had employed. I just drove my car dumbfounded yet fascinated. Of course, I wasn't convinced any of this was real. When we finally arrived at the town, I could tell that the reunion hadn't been kind to it. Sure, there were some modern buildings, but most were the typical old Soviet ones. Many looked neglected and most likely hadn't been renovated in decades. Sure, there was a new shopping mall in the center of town, but the rest felt like a relic of old times. The address the old man had written down led us to a huge, old building complex. The professor's eyes lit up when he saw the place. My god, it's still standing! he said in a low voice. After I'd parked the car, we made our way towards the front entrance. The place really was huge, almost gigantic. By now, though, it looked almost completely abandoned. Back in the day, the property seemed to have been protected by a metal fence, but now it stood wide open. While I looked in awe at the size of the buildings, the professor hurried along towards the front entrance. I almost had to run to keep up with the old man. I can't believe they left it like that. I was sure they'd torn it all down by now he said as he stepped up to the front door. I didn't feel too happy about stepping inside with all the no trespassing signs around. As soon as the professor pushed the door open, some kind of alarm started to ring. I cursed out loud and was about to run off when it stopped as soon as it had begun. A minute later, a man as old as the professor came towards the door. Who the hell are you? Are you blind? Can't you read the signs? The man cursed at us in a heavy Russian accent. He broke up when his eyes focused on the professor. Sebastian? Has God made him, old friend? What are you still doing here? I'd have thought you'd run back to Mother Russia a long time ago. Both of them started to laugh and went forward to hug each other. I felt a bit awkward standing next to them. Well, what brings you here? I'm sure you're not just here to say hello, right? My God, you're right, Ivan. I'm here because of the machine. It might have worked after all. What are you... Wait, you mean that machine? What the hell are you talking about? There might be proof. Marcus, you did bring the box like I told you, didn't you? I nodded. Yet again, I felt a bit awkward as both of them stared at me with wide eyes. Uh, yeah, hold on, here it is. The moment I'd taken it out of my backpack, the professor almost ripped it from my hands. He opened it quickly and took out the postcard, handing it to his friend. His reaction was exactly the same as the professor's had been a few days ago. His eyes grew wide, his mouth opened, and he looked from the professor to me and then back to the professor. Struganow, Ivan said. His hands were shaking as he looked down at the postcard once more. His shock lasted for only a few moments, though, before it was replaced by excitement. He put the postcard back and took a look at each of the other items individually. At last, he took hold of the old portable radio. Come on, Sebastian. Come on, we gotta see if it's true. You too, young man. Come on. Without waiting for an answer, the man rushed off into the complex. We followed him down a long corridor, then another one, and then through a vast, empty warehouse. Where are we going, Professor? 
I asked in a low voice. To my office, of course. That's where I've got all of my notes. Ivan yelled back at us. I wondered if it was a good idea to follow this strange guy. God knows, he was acting weird. Who knows, maybe he'd snapped long ago and tried to lure us God knows where. When I looked over at the professor, though, his face showed no doubt at all. He followed Ivan along with a bright smile on his face. Soon enough, Ivan announced that we'd made it. He pushed open the door, and we stepped into a barren-looking office room. There was an old computer on a desk, a bookshelf, and countless others filled with files and old data mediums. I can't believe it, it's all still here, the professor reminisced. Well, of course. Of course it is. After you left, someone had to take care of the place, you know? The professor laughed at that. Well, I guess some things never change. Ivan put down the radio on his desk and started to search through the shelves. Well, now, where did I put it? It should be... Wait, no, is it over there? I stood at the doorframe and watched the strange spectacle. Minutes passed as the strange Russian man searched through his office. There it is, he finally exclaimed. Uh, look at this, Sebastian. It can't be, is this? It's the same, the same radio. So what's so great about those radios? I, I bet there's a hundred thousand of them out there, I mumbled. No, young man. You don't know what I'm... Just come over here. See that? He asked as he pointed at a couple of Russian letters carved into the plastic of his radio. So? Now look at that. With that, he picked up the one from my uncle's box. He turned it around a few times before he found what he'd been looking for. It was the exact same carvings at the exact same place. The professor next to me inhaled sharply. So it really did work after all. While the professor stared in awe at the two radios, I stood there dumbfounded. What the hell was going on? Anyone could have carved the same letters into two freaking radios. What's the... My god, this is it. This proves it. I stared at Ivan, who'd opened up the old map that was at the bottom of the box. Do you see this, young man? He asked, holding up the map, almost pushing it into my face. I had to shove it aside to even be able to answer the man. Yeah, I see it. It's a freaking map. I've seen it before, and it was in my... No, p that's not what I'm talking about. He started to fidget around with it, turning it a bit. What I mean is... Again, he turned it, this time to the left. Right there. It took me a bit to see it, but I finally saw that there were a few notes that covered the map below the legend. They were in old German handwriting, and were most likely by my uncle. The professor was right next to me in an instant, and almost shoved me aside to read them. Marked all the spots in which the strange items appeared. So far, they only turned up on the meadow near town. Don't tell me. Our machine actually worked, Ivan. I can't believe it. This is... The professor broke off, and I could see a hint of tears in his eyes. All those years. I thought it was all... He broke off again. Okay, you know what? I've got no clue what the hell you guys are talking about. Dr. Nikolaev, Professor, could you please tell me what's going on? Don't tell me it's all about this time machine thing. Exactly, young man. How the hell had I ended up right in the middle of a lousy excuse for a science fiction movie? Now look at this, Sebastian. I heard Ivan say as he brought out a handful of items. The two of them went through my uncle's box, comparing them to the ones inside. They were ooing and aahing at the contents, laughing in excitement. Come here, young man, you see this? With that, Ivan pulled me aside and showed me one of the various files stored away on his shelves. Each page showed detailed information about the items that, as Ivan called it, had been sent back in time. There was an entry about everything inside the box except for the photograph. I turned page after page, reading a bit here and there, but it was all so outlandish. There wasn't even an entry about a freaking cat. Okay, I turned to Ivan. So you're telling me that all those items my uncle collected and left to me in this box were sent back in time by you? Seriously? Ivan grinned. You want to see it? See what? The machine, of course. It's still operational, Ivan? The professor called out. Of course. Come along, come along. With that, he led us out into the complex again, this time on a path that went from one hallway to the next, until we descended into a huge basement area. Countless gigantic computers lined the walls. There was a terminal in the center of the room, and in front of it was a metal platform. 
The platform was about two meters in diameter and surrounded by bizarre machinery. I can't believe it, Ivan. After all those years, but... Are those... Well, old friend, you think I've been doing nothing all these years? The professor was out of it and rushed into the room to check out the machinery and the many computers. So that's your time machine? I asked with not just a bit of sarcasm. The whole thing looked like a freaking movie prop. Ivan nodded. And you're telling me this thing here can send things back in time? Yeah, right. I bite. How is this thing even supposed to work? Ivan started telling me that the whole project began back in the 70s. Researching time travel had been going on for some time, he said. But the first practical test site was constructed right here. At least, the first one that was bigger than some basement. The idea, the professor chimed in, was much more complicated than sending items back in time. The initial test, though, never showed any success. The project was cut from funding, and Moscow abandoned the idea. And those initial tests were... what? I asked in a half-serious voice. They explained to me that it was a simple manipulation of space and time. They tried to send items to a different place at first. Teleportation, so to say. Other tests included sending them a few minutes into the future. But nothing ever happened. The items were left on the platform and didn't disappear or anything. What we don't know, what we didn't even take into consideration, Ivan mumbled on as he walked through the room, was that instead of actually sending the item itself, the machine would create an exact copy of it at a certain point in time. At that point, young man, was exactly when your uncle stumbled upon them and marked his findings on the very map you brought with you. What about the cat? There was a file about a cat. Struganow, the professor said in a sad voice. It was a cat, he began, that had lingered around the complex. Soon some of the personnel adopted the little guy. During the experiments, we also tried organic matter and eventually live samples. I don't know what must have ridden us, but we were desperate. So someday, someone suggested we should use Struganow. The result was... Well, the poor thing was turned inside out. We tried mice and other rodents we found, but the result was always the same. Excruciating death. There was a fundamental mistake in our calculations, Ivan elaborated. Once we discovered it, it was clear that our process wouldn't work with a living organism. It was not possible, would never be. Once the old man was finished, I couldn't help but smile. All right, that's a fine story, really fine. Did you ever think of becoming a writer, Mr. Nikolaev? For the first time, Ivan's face showed clear signs of anger and frustration. You still don't believe me. With all of this here. This machine could be anything. God knows it might not even do anything at all. For all I know, those are just props from some old movie. Do you want to try it? The man suddenly asked with a big grin on his face. Wait, Ivan, it, it's still working? The funding was cut and the project was abandoned, so how? The professor cut in. Abandoned by everyone but me. Everyone walked away, even you, old friend. But I stayed. I continued this research for the past three decades. There are still people who know about this project. People interested in it. People with more than enough money. <laughs> well then, turn it on, I said. But tell me one thing, if the machine just sends back a copy in time, how the hell are we supposed to know if it really works? How about this? Ivan said and took out a ballpoint pen made of metal and placed it in the middle of the platform. I didn't get it. How the hell would he even be able to prove that anything happened at all? Then it hit me. I understood what he was trying to do. All the other items had supposedly been found by my uncle. So if he'd actually sent back this pen, it had to have been found too, right? While I thought about this, Ivan was already tinkering with the computer terminal. Just have to make a few slight adjustments here. Change the settings, input a few things. Change that as well, and start. The machinery around the platform began to buzz with activity. They all started to glow before light engulfed the platform. The pen began to shine more and more intensely before the room was flooded by a flash of light. After that, the whole room fell into darkness. It took a minute before the lights came back on. The pen was still there on the platform. All that had changed was that it was still slightly glowing. Ivan went forward to pick it up. 
Well then, let's see if it's worked. Ivan said to the professor and me before he rushed from the room to get back to his office. On the way there, I looked at my phone and sighed at myself for wasting my weekend out here. What the hell was I even doing? Why was I here? There was no way any of this was real. This crazy Russian must have lost his mind, being holed up here for the past 30 years. What about Professor Newman, though? Did, did he actually believe Ivan? Shit, this was all way too weird. Once we'd made it back to the office, the three of us took a look at the box. I froze. Right there, between all the other items, was now a ballpoint pen. As I looked at it, I felt a slight pain in my head, and I was suddenly very unsure about it. I couldn't tell anymore if this thing had been there all along. Ivan next to me burst out in jubilation. He screamed up in excitement and actually jumped into the air. This hadn't been there before. There's no way. I'm positive about it. See, Sebastian? See the pen? He turned to the professor. I bought it back in the 80s. Had it specifically made for me, remember? The professor nodded. Well, young man, tell me, how could your uncle have found this pen back in the day if it was made right before the fall of the Berlin Wall? I said nothing. Ivan, though, stepped closer to me and showed me one other thing. On the pen was a beautiful engraving of Russian letters. For Ivan Nikolaev, the professor read. I didn't know what to say. I stared at the box and at Ivan. We've got no time to lose, Sebastian, he urged on the professor. With that, the two of them carefully placed the contents of the box on the office desk to catalog them. When Ivan found the old photograph, though, he eyed it for a moment before he handed it to me. A personal item? Yeah, a picture of my great-uncle and a relative, I blurted out before he took it. For a few minutes, I watched the two of them before I spoke up and told them I had enough. This whole thing had been going on for way too long. Look, I get it, Mr. Nikolaev. You, you tricked me, didn't you? You snuck a second pen into the box while I wasn't watching, right? There's no other way. You're delusions. And of course, the common mind can't grasp it. The man scoffed at me. At this remark, I started laughing. Look, you're insane. Being holed up in here has driven you mad. Time travel is unbelievable. With that, I walked out of the office. Can't believe I came here, I said out loud. I'd barely taken a few steps into the corridor when Professor Newman came after me. Marcus, don't be rash. Don't you see what we're doing here? You saw it, didn't you? All I can see is a crazy Russian who's made up some stories about time travel. Nothing else. I'm going to be in the car, Professor, but I really just want to drive off and forget about this whole thing. Well, then go. I've got things to discuss with Ivan. I'm going to get back later by train, but thank you. You've got no idea. This box, those items. He broke off, shaking his head. He actually gave me a quick hug before he told me to have a safe trip back. When I finally drove off, I couldn't believe the day I'd had. I cursed myself for being shoehorned into this whole damn trip. This whole thing happened more than ten years ago. By now, the story is nothing more than a funny anecdote that I tell friends and colleagues. It's nothing but a, hey, this weird little thing happened to me back in the day. After that day, Professor Newman never returned to the university, though. After our visit with Ivan Nikolaev, the man quit his teaching job. We were told he started working elsewhere. It was never mentioned where exactly, but... I was sure I knew. My guess was confirmed a few months ago when a letter arrived. Professor Newman wrote to tell me that he was still working on the same project. By now, though, Ivan had died, and the professor himself was much too old to keep up with it. He mentioned that he was starting a new research team and wanted me to be a part of it. You see, by now I've got my master's in theoretical physics, and I made a bit of a name for myself as a researcher. I never answered his letter, that is, until today. I recently moved into a new apartment. It was by sheer accident that I stumbled upon the old photograph of Uncle Mike and his supposed relative. When I looked at it today, though, I couldn't help but shiver. People can change a lot in a decade. A lot of things can happen. I've put on a bit of weight, and I have shorter hair than I used to. There's one particular thing, though. A few years ago, I got into a car accident. It was quite severe and left me with a permanent scar on my face. On the left side of my face. 
when I stared at the old photograph today and the man by my uncle's side, my head started to spin. The man in the picture has the same scar as me. But the more I look at him, the more things I notice. He has the same short hair as me and the same puffy face. I was sweating by now. The man in the picture, it couldn't be, could it? I quickly went through all my paperwork and found the letter by Professor Newman. I'd never thrown it away for some reason. I reread it this time more carefully. The same project, he said. Was he still working on that damn teleportation device? You know, that time machine? What if the thing had actually been working all along? For hours, I told myself to forget about it and to get rid of both the letter and the photograph. Yet I can't seem to do so. It's as if something is stopping me from doing so. It's almost as if a mysterious power is making decisions for me, and I, I can't do anything about it. The more I look at the photograph and its many implications, I feel that my path is already predestined. There never was a different one, was there? I guess the passing of time is indeed a very strange thing. Now that I'm finished typing this all out, it's time to go through with it. It's time to give old Professor Newman a call. If you enjoyed that story and you want to hear more by the author, you can definitely find them on YouTube, TikTok, and their website, renwriter.com. Remember to smile. The people at home don't want to see frowning faces, okay? Got it. The woman marched quickly away, saying something into her headset, then glancing down at the clipboard in her hand. Lights were shining hot on my face, cameras pointed at me, and I felt myself sweating. Warm drips of it ran down my cheeks, but I was too afraid to wipe them away. Suddenly the host walked onto the stage. A slim, short kid with slick back, blonde hair, and a dark suit, who appeared no more than 20 years old, if not younger. He ignored us and looked at the cameras, checking to make sure everything was ready, as if he was the one running the whole show. Finally, when everything was set, he glanced back at us and gave us a quick, show-stopping smile. His pearly white teeth sparkled in the bright lights, his eyes dark as night but glimmering with intelligence. All set, folks? We nodded nervously. I quickly looked at my two competitors, a tall, athletic man named Dan who ran a catering company, and a woman named Susan who was a private chef. Being the executive chef at a well-respected restaurant... I felt confident in my chances to win the cooking battle against the two of them. I had 20 years of experience and a culinary school education under my belt. Of course, I had no idea what I was in for. None of us did, not yet. The bright lights shone in my eyes, obscuring my vision, and I heard someone begin to count down. Okay, everybody, we are live in five, four. The woman stopped counting out loud, and only her fingers could be seen in the glare held up and letting us know how long until the camera started to roll. Three, two, one. She pointed at the host, who spoke his opening line seamlessly and with practiced efficiency. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Chopping Block, the only live TV cooking competition of its kind. I'm your host, Eltil Natus, and as always, our judge is the one and only Bub Beelzel. You folks at home know how the game works. There's only two rounds, and our competitors will receive a mystery cauldron full of ingredients, and will be forced to make a dish using each of them. Then we'll be tasting each and every dish to find out who's going to be on the chopping block. He turned around and looked at us with his showman's grin. I was slightly surprised this egomaniac hadn't arranged for a studio audience. It seemed like just the show for that sort of thing. Cheesy and over the top. Ready, contestants? We nodded our heads excitedly, still not knowing what was coming. We would find out soon, though. One by one. Okay, bring down the cauldrons. Three massive cauldrons were lowered from the ceiling by ropes until they settled to the floor. I tried to smile and not think about the cameras pointed at me, the lights shining hot on me from the ceiling, and the audience watching at home. Not that I had ever seen or heard of the show before, but I guess that a lot of people probably watched it. Dan, Susan, and I began to open the cauldron lids. 
one by one, our faces turned sour, and we grimaced and looked at each other with confused disgust. What is that? I exclaimed. I couldn't help it. The black pot was full of blood and indeterminate organs. I guess they were from a pig or a cow, but I wasn't really sure. The size of them wasn't quite right for either. Venison, maybe? I wondered. But no, it wasn't that either. The clock was ticking, so I didn't think about it too much. I had worked with Awful before, so I just dug my hands in and grabbed each of the four slippery, blood-soaked organs and ran over to the sink with them. Maybe this was a Halloween episode they were filming in advance, I thought to myself. That must be it. That would explain the cauldrons and the blood-soaked innards. I just wish they had said something, because it caught me off guard. But then the other two contestants looked uncertain as well. They were still working up their courage to examine the cuts more carefully, poking at the bloody bits with their fingers and making faces. The thought occurred to me again that I might win this competition. I just couldn't afford to get cocky. After rinsing off the organs in the sink to get a better look at them, I saw it was a heart and a liver as well as a pair of kidneys. Still unable to determine which species of creature they came from, I decided to just wing it and sauté the liver and kidneys, then process them to make a spread for a tartine. There wasn't a lot of time for anything else. The round ended with a loud buzzer, and I, I felt pretty confident having a decent-looking dish to present. This fact was not lost on the host of the show. Eltil Natus looked at us one by one and scoffed at everyone's dish but mine. The other two were not particularly well-plated, I, I hate to say. They looked rushed. Still, Dan managed to make a passable flatbread, and Susan prepared a handmade pasta, although I could tell she had struggled with the time constraints. Her ravioli had exploded in the boiling water, resulting in her filling being mostly lost. Okay, time for judging. The host took our plates and went back behind a black curtain, which was set off to the side. I presumed it was where the judge sat, but it was odd that we didn't get to meet him. About ten minutes later, the host came back with one covered plate in his hand. Okay, time to find out who's on the chopping block tonight. He lifted the dome, revealing Susan's exploded ravioli. I saw her cover her face with her hand in shame. Sorry, Susan. Bub thought your ravioli was well cooked, but unfortunately we both found it salty. And your filling, sadly, did not make the plate. For those reasons... You have been selected for the chopping block. I understand. Thank you for the opportunity, she said and went over to shake his hand. Please exit behind the black curtain, the young host said, looking sympathetic. Be well. We took a break after that for half an hour before moving on, so that we could drink some water and use the restroom if needed. The next round began, and the cauldrons were lowered down once again, and Dan and I set to work grabbing ingredients from them. This time, it was small pieces of meat that looked freshly carved and bloody, floating in a sanguineous bath at the bottom of the cauldron. "'Bub and I are still hungry,' said the host enthusiastically. "'Make us a nice filling entree this round.' We set to work, and I fulfilled his request, creating a hamburger from the strange-looking bits of meat. It was quite lean, so I added a hunk of beef fat from the fridge for the perfect 70-30 to meat-to-fat ratio." Then I formed the patties with my hands. The smell was strange. Not lamb or beef, not pork or venison. It wasn't goat or emu. I had tried those before, as well as ostrich, and was fairly certain this was not a meat I had ever eaten before. I nibbled on the cooked pieces, tasting it for seasoning. Mm, more salt. I just hoped we would find out what it was at the end of the show, since I was pretty curious, to be honest. The time expired, and the buzzer went off once again. Time's up. Bring your dishes forward and prepare to be judged by Bub. Leaving our plates on the table provided, we stepped back and waited. Instead of taking the dishes back to the judge, this time we heard him coming out to us. Heavy footsteps came thudding louder and louder from behind the curtain, and my heart began to beat fast and hard in my chest as I felt an impending sense of doom and dread overcome me. The curtains rippled and ruffled in the wind as if something immense was moving behind them. And then I saw him. And then I saw it. 
The thing which came out from behind the black curtain was huge and dark, covered in tendrils of smoke and steam which moved in and out of it and all around it, making it seem not entirely real, but more like a special effect. And yet flies buzzed around it and swarmed alongside it, as if one with the beast. Welcome our famous judge, everybody. Prince of Demons, Lord of the Order of the Flies, Bob Beelzy. It's Beelze, Bob, you little twerp. The shadowy demon creature's voice was like broken glass scraping across a chalkboard, like an avalanche colliding with a freight train during a thunderstorm. It felt like hearing it would make me go deaf. Don't you talk to me like that. I'll tell Dad. Oh, you would too, little daddy's boy. What? Ah, nothing. Forget it. Let's just eat Susan. She looks delicious. Dan and I stood staring, jaws hanging open, watching as the two demons ate our food. That was obviously what they were, and even worse, I realize now that we had unwittingly prepared our former co-contestant and served her up to them as burgers and stew. Why are you doing this? I screamed at them. And who would watch this show? The host replied with his mouth full while chewing Susan's stew. Well, first of all, everybody in hell loves this show. It's in its 508th season. And to answer your first question, why? Listen to yourself. We're demons. It's what we do. You know, just trying to make the world a little bit more evil, one person at a time. You'll never recover from this. And hey, who knows, maybe you'll infect a few more people with the inevitable darkness that will fester inside of you. The shadow monster chuckled beneath its breath. Uh, this burger is delicious, by the way. You win by a long shot. I did a mental fist pump, despite the situation. I had won the competition, even if it was orchestrated by demons and the mystery box items were human remains. I had still won. That's got to be worth something, right? Turns out that something was my life. The winner of Chopping Block is the only one allowed to leave at the end of the game show. The runner-up is dismembered and used for the appetizer round the next day. So what are you going to do with your winnings? The human-looking demon asked as she was letting me out the door. The $10,000 they had given me felt more like blood money now. A bribe. But I didn't want to find out what they would do if I told anyone, so I vowed to keep my mouth shut. I'm not sure, I said, stepping out onto the sidewalk. Maybe I'll open a restaurant. A burger place. I've always been really good at making burgers. You definitely should, Bob. And if you do, I'll stop by, that's for damn sure. I turned around and started to walk away. Oh, and Bob? She called after me. Yeah? Don't forget about our Tournament of Champions next month. Can't wait to see what you come up with for that. You're going to have way stiffer competition next time, though. Good luck. She slammed the door shut and left me standing in the street, stunned and terrified. I would have to do it all over again next month. Anybody have any good recipes? When Blake first came to me and told me what he wanted to do, I thought he'd lost his mind. Nobody robs a casino in real life. Not unless they want to go to prison. Even in the movies, people don't get away with it. But the more he talked about it, showing me his blueprints and plans, the more I realized he'd been thinking about this for a long, long time. And his idea was ingenious. If executed correctly, there would be a very good chance at safety and a clean getaway. And he had a man on the inside who had revealed to him the weaknesses in the casino's security systems. Still, I imagined there were plenty of factors he hadn't accounted for. Oh, that's why I came to you, he said when I pointed that out. You're the engineer in the family. How would you like to retire at 40, Brian? We'd be so rich, you'd never have to work another day in your life at that soul-crushing job you're always complaining about. Not only that, but this is our chance to make history. That part got to me. Don't ask me why. The whole thing felt like a challenge to my analytical mind, which I couldn't deny. The feat of surpassing a casino security system would be talked about for decades, perhaps even centuries. Books would be written about it, movies would be made, and podcasts would explore the theories on how it was accomplished. Alright, I'm in. 
I finally told him after several days of consideration. But if things start to go sideways, just promise me you'll put a stop to this. I don't want to see either one of us in prison. He just smiled, saying that wasn't going to happen. And he was right. What ended up happening was much, much worse. While Blake worked to assemble a team, I set about doing my end of things. There were so many unknowns right from the start, but the gears in my head were turning, and I was already starting to think of solutions to our problems. As an engineer, that's what I do, and I'm damn good at it. Measurements needed to be taken, first of all, to get even the most basic layout and understanding of what we were going to be excavating. Otherwise, we might end up drilling through the floor of the security office, instead of the casino vault. The problem was, you couldn't just go into the casino with a tape measure and start taking notes. I had to get creative. One morning, after making a series of initial measurements, I painted a white line on my bicycle tire, then rode around the outside of the casino counting the revolutions on my wheel. By the end of the day, using these measurements and the information from Blake's man on the inside, we had our exact coordinates for the vault. Pretty clever, right? The next step was establishing a base camp and a drilling location. Blake helped me scout out nearby buildings that were for rent or lease, and we found one which was ideal in an old warehouse a few blocks away from the casino. Using a dummy corporation Blake had set up, we rented the place and began to dig. Little by little, I made my way into the nearby sewer system. From there, we'd make another hole, which would lead us into the vault. The sewers would act as our escape route, allowing us to evade police and pop up a few blocks away right beside the getaway vehicle. One morning, Blake told me he had finished assembling the crew. We got together at the rented building to discuss our plans and go over the operation. There was Gas, the street racer. He had a reputation for his flatulence, but also for fast driving, quick instincts, and he had a long resume as a getaway man. He could drift with the best of them, and routinely won pink slips in late-night street races, acquiring cars which he then sold to upgrade his own ride. If he gave you a lift somewhere, though, it was bound to be a smelly journey. Our lock man was none other than Slim Fingers Pete, a notorious locksmith and safecracker. After learning to pick locks from his father growing up, Pete owned his own locksmith and vault building business for 30 years. Eventually, though, he got tired of the low wages and rude customers and took up a life of crime. He began making a name for himself as a modern day Robin Hood, stealing jewels, cash, and priceless artifacts from the various rich neighborhoods around town. But he dressed shabbily, and the rumor was he donated the stolen cash to charity. Who knew if that was really true, though? Lastly, we had our demolitions expert. C4 Cindy, as she was known around town, or as she preferred to be addressed, Cinders. After two tours of duty serving in the Special Forces, Cinders was tossed out for insubordination, given a dishonorable discharge and sent packing from the military. This resulted in a lifelong vendetta from that day forward with every authority figure, especially if they were U.S. military. Still, she mostly wore camouflage and had a bright pink buzz cut. Every crew needed a comedian to ease the tension, and Cinders took on that role from day one, although she needed reminding sometimes to keep things serious when it mattered. The five of us sat around a table in front of a large chalkboard as Blake began to lay out the plan. We were in our rented warehouse a few blocks away from the casino, on the main level away from the sewer smell which had taken over the basement, all thanks to my drilling. The stink was getting worse, though, and it was spreading to the main level now. I got a few glares from the other team members who knew what I was up to down there. Still, it was all a necessary part of the plan. All right, eyes up front, everybody. Yeah, I know the smell is a distraction, but I'm going over the operation for the first time with all of you, so just listen and save your questions for the end. Yes, teacher, Cinder said sarcastically, leaning forward and putting her chin in her hands like a precocious child. Cinder's... If you want to get to blow something up later, you better start taking this seriously. I am, she pouted. But then after seeing his dead-set expression, she relaxed her posture, leaned back, and spoke in her grown-up voice. Okay, fine, I'm listening. Blake took a deep breath and steeled himself for the grand unveiling. I was the only one in the room who knew all the details since he'd practiced this presentation with me the night before. 
All right, listen up. Now, this plan is a bit complex, so bear with me. Yes, your job is going to be the simplest. Monday, 0400 hours, you're going to be parked the east side of Park Street, six blocks from the casino. Whatever vehicle you boost needs to be big enough to seat all five of us. Plus, we're going to need cargo space and room for the cash. So I'm thinking of something like a work van. Preferably discreet, white in color, no markings. Great, so you want me to steal a boring, slow piece of shit? He muttered, grinning. Yeah, no problem. Boring and slow means the cops probably aren't going to notice it. Make sure you steal some plates, too. Somebody who isn't going to notice they're missing. This ain't my first rodeo, Blake. This shit goes without saying. Yeah, just making sure. This one's going to come down to all the details. That's why I picked you guys. I know you're the best. We all waited for him to continue, and he looked at the chalkboard and started to write things out and draw diagrams, expanding on the execution of the plan. Pete, Cinders, and I will be down in the sewers. Brian will be up on street level with the police scanner, keeping an eye on the front of the casino, keeping in touch with our man on the inside. All this will guarantee that if someone finds out what we're doing, we'll get plenty of notice so we can escape. Everyone glared at me, hearing that I would be safely up on street level while they were down in the sewers getting their hands dirty. Brian has been the one in the sewer drilling, doing all the hard work, all the dangerous shit up until now. So that's part of the reason why he gets to be on lookout duty. Which comes with its own risks as well. Anybody got a problem with that? Blake, the undisputed leader of the group, looked around at the others, sensing the shift in the room. It would have been easy to read into it as nepotism, but the three of them softened a few seconds later and Cinder's smiled, laughing out loud. Hell, no wonder you stink so bad, Brian. I feel sorry for you having to deal with Gas's nasty shits down in the sewers. That eased the tension and everyone laughed. Okay, okay, settle down. Let's, let's get through this, and then we can make fun of Gas more afterwards. You can all tell me your concerns. You got it, boss, Cinder said, doing a sarcastic military salute. So here's the part you're going to like, Cinders. You're going to blow a big-ass hole in the bottom of the vault. And we're going to use this ladder contraption devised by Brian to climb in. I stood up to show them the prototype I'd designed, holding the nondescript cylinder in my hands. Okay, so one person will hold the remote while the other one throws this up through the hole. Once it's inside the vault, the person with the remote's going to hit the button to engage the stabilizer bar. Demonstrating how it worked, I hit a red button on the remote control and the thing expanded instantly, like a two-ended lightsaber made of steel. It's kind of heavy, so just watch out it doesn't fall on you. It might take a few attempts to throw it up through the hole, but it's doable. I've tried it. Whoever wants to be the one making the throw will have plenty of time to practice, too. My ends are as sure as they come, said Pete. I'll toss it up through the gap on the first go. Practice or no practice. Let's go with a bit of practice, just to be safe, guys, Blake said, continuing with the plan. Once we're all up in the vault, we'll only have a few minutes. Pete, you're going to go in first. You get started on the lockboxes. Cinders, you'll be doing the same on the other end of the vault using the control explosives. Whatever you do, you have to keep it quiet. Ah, so no big booms, she protested, stomping her feet on the floor a few times, going back to her childish alter ego. No, no big booms. Only little miniature booms. Then you can blow up as much shit as you want afterwards. A couple million bucks will buy you a lot of explosives. Trust me. Cinder smiled, looking off wistfully. Ooh, a whole private island. Just for me to blow up. What if someone hears something and comes in to investigate? I asked, playing devil's advocate. Blake and I had gone over this before, so I knew he had a great plan. I just wanted to prove it to everybody else. That's the best part. There's going to be a fire alarm test happening at the same time, so nobody's going to be able to hear anything through the thick steel door. And if they do, well, our guy on the inside will be in charge of the cameras, so he'll just tell them everything looks fine not to be worried. A fake camera loop's going to be playing the whole time, so if anyone asks to see, you can show them. What if that doesn't convince them? Pete asked. What happens if they insist they want to see inside for themselves? Well, we got exactly four minutes to clear out. That's how long it takes to open the vault. And by then we'll be long gone, vanished in the maze of sewers beneath the casino. Everyone nodded and Blake continued telling us the plan, but it was all straightforward after that. 
we all realized it was going to be challenging, but manageable. And what we didn't know was that Blake wasn't telling us the whole plan. I didn't even know what he was up to as much as I thought I did. When the big day came, I was supposed to be sitting in front of the casino as the lookout man. But Blake came down with a stomach bug, and he looked pale as a ghost after throwing up all night. He was shaky and on the verge of passing out every time he stood up, but he insisted on going ahead with the operation. I did what any other big brother would do. I volunteered to switch places with him. You stay in the van, okay, Blake? I'm the only one who knows this plan as well as you do. And if you're going to insist on going through with this today, then I'm going to insist on you staying in the van and being the lookout. He reluctantly agreed, and that was how I ended up being the one down in the sewer, standing alongside Cinders and Pete. The three of us watched through our protective goggles as the ultra-bright white light burned a hole clean through the steel. Molten metal dripped down bright red, burning a hole in the cement by our feet. I took a step back. Cinders looked at me and laughed, the liquid steel splashing just inches away from her toes, reflecting red in her welding goggles. Careful, Brian, she said, grinning. The floor is lava. After a hole had been built through the steel, Cinders sprayed the blackened edges with foam to cool them down for our entrance. Then Pete took the steel contraption I designed and threw it up through the hole, with just enough gentle spin so that it turned sideways at the peak of his toss. Then I hit the red button on the remote control, engaging the anchors. A steel rod shot out of either end of the cylinder, locking the device in place. I hit another button, and the rope ladder, which was concealed inside, popped out, unraveling until it reached the floor. Nice throw, Pete, I said, clapping our locksmith on the back. Hey, nice job yourself. That's one hell of a contraption. I might just need to borrow it for my next job. Cinders began climbing the ladder, and I followed after her, into the sound of the ringing fire alarm. So far, the plan was going perfectly, and there was no sign of anyone having heard our entrance. After this, you might not need to do any more jobs, Pete. Once we got up into the vault, the three of us began to giggle softly like children in a toy store. There was a stack of cash at the center of the vault far surpassing anything we could have imagined. There had to be tens of millions of dollars, if not more. Forget the bloody lockboxes, Pete said over the alarms. This here is more than we need. Let's take it get the hell out of here. This is where things started getting weird. I agreed with Pete that the lockboxes weren't worth the trouble with a huge pile of cash sitting there. But Cinders didn't say anything. Instead, she went into a corner and started quietly pulling things out of her demolition bag. What are you doing, Cinders? Help us load up the cash. Fuck the boxes. She just ignored me, starting to set small explosives on a few of the lockbox doors. They were lined up on one wall like safety deposit boxes in a bank vault. Cinders, we don't need to risk the explosions. We've got more than enough right here. But she just kept ignoring me. Instead, she just attached some cable to the small explosives on the lockbox doors and unwound the spool of it, stepping away from them. Let her work, Blake said into my earpiece. You get the money, let her do her thing. Why? Why risk it when we... A small explosion went off, interrupting me, and the room filled with a small, hazy cloud of white smoke. I shot a look over my shoulder, furrowing my brow. It didn't make sense. Why were they taking chances when we had so much guaranteed cash? Unless they knew something I didn't. I didn't have time to stay distracted, so I kept piling money into the bags we brought, throwing them down into the sewers below. We were nearly half finished. Shit, somebody heard that, Blake said in my earpiece. You guys gotta get out of there now. My guy can't stop them. They're coming in right now. A noise came from the vault door like a large steel plate being turned. Damn it, Cinders! She was still ignoring me, pulling something out of the lockboxes. I filled one more bag and then told Pete to start heading down the ladder. We were leaving a lot of cash behind. I went over to Cinders and tapped her on the shoulder. You just screwed up this whole heist. What the hell were you thinking? I told you to leave the lockboxes alone. Instead of turning around, she just kept staring at the thing in her hand. A vial full of green liquid which she had extracted from the lockbox. I noticed a cut on Cinder's finger where a piece of broken glass had pierced her skin. And then I saw the green liquid dripping from her hand. 
the vial had cracked in the explosion, and whatever was inside of it was now seeping into Cinder's bloodstream. Cinders? Are you okay? I think you should put that down. We don't know what it is. Much to my surprise, she actually listened to me. With her fingers shaking badly, she set the vial of diminishing green liquid back into the lockbox, and a little puddle began to form beneath it. I know what it is, Brian. I've known all along. That's the whole reason I agreed to this heist. Somebody paid me to extract that vial from the safe. The same person who paid your brother to set this all up. You really think he just happened to have a man on the inside? You think he just happened to get sick today? No. He was scared. Scared of this shit. He didn't want to die. This was all beginning to upset me. I could feel my blood boiling. What the hell are you talking about, Cinders? My brother would never set me up. Blake? Blake, tell her. There was a deep sigh in my earpiece as my brother hesitated. <sighs> I'm sorry, Brian. It wasn't supposed to break. The vial... The vial was supposed to be sturdy enough to survive a natural disaster. This was never supposed to happen. The vault door was unlocking and I realized we had wasted too much time. I began to hustle back towards the ladder, telling Cinders to leave the vial behind. When she turned around, I didn't like what I saw. Purple-black veins spread inwards from the periphery of her eyes. Her pupils were turning crimson as she opened her mouth and drool began to pour out from her lower lip. She growled, making a low sound in her throat like a dog. Her eyes were fixed on me as I backed away. But then the vault door opened and all hell broke loose. A few security guards drew their pistols as they entered, fanning out and moving towards the two of us. I had my foot on the ladder and was about to climb down when the closest one persuaded me to stop. Freeze! Don't move! He yelled at me, his pistol pointed at my face. Without many other options, I raised my hands in submission. It looked as if our flawless plan had failed. The guard came over to me with handcuffs at the ready, but... Cinders wasn't responding to the other guards as well as I was. Hey, I said to get your hands up in the air, lady. I'm not going to ask you again. Suddenly she raced towards one of the men, growling and drooling as she ran. He screamed at her to stop, but she seemed not to hear, instead lunging at him like a rabid dog as he squeezed the trigger. No, no, ah, get off me! He howled as the gun discharged into the air over and over again, his shots wild and aimless. The bullets began to ricochet around the vault, one of them hitting the security guard closest to me. He dropped his gun, yelping in pain as he grabbed his shoulder. What the hell, Dan? He yelled and then saw what was happening and raced over to assist the other two guards. Cinders quickly turned her attention to them, raking her nails across one guard's face, scratching his eyes and blinding him in one rapid motion. Then she swept her other hand across his face from the other direction, alternating hands and scratching at his face over and over again in a frenzied attack. By the end of it, he was in a shuddering heap on the floor, bleeding out. The guard who had been closest to me was the only one of the three left, and he started firing his gun at her without any further warning. Bullets hit Cinder square in the chest, in the ribcage, in the neck, and in her shoulder, but she made no response. Instead, she leapt up onto him like a tiger. Her teeth sunk into his neck, ripping out his throat in one quick bite. He pushed and clawed at her face desperately, gurgling as blood bubbled up from the wound, his skin turning paler. That was when I realized I hadn't been moving. I needed to get away or I would be next. I started climbing down the ladder, my eyes darting around the vault room as I went, taking a final look at the chaos. Just before the room disappeared from my view, I saw one of the dead security guard's eyes snap open purple-black veins spreading inwards from the edges of his eyes towards his crimson-red pupils. That was when I realized what that shit really was. 
stuff in the vial. It was a fucking zombie virus. We just released it into the wild. With startling speed, the guard rose to his feet and came running my way. I stumbled down the rope ladder two and three rungs at a time, too scared to move safely. My heart was pounding fast as my feet slipped and I slid down the rest of the way, landing badly on my ankle and rolling it. I cried out in pain, looking up at the hole to see if anyone was coming. Instead of climbing down, the security guard fell down through the blasted hole in the vault floor, landing on the cement sewer floor with a hard crack, his leg breaking clean in half. A bone was jutting out through one side in a sharp splinter. But this didn't stop him. He got up and began to lurch and hop towards me, dragging his splintered femur and clawing desperately at the air just in front of me as I backed away. I got to my feet and started running the adrenaline numbing the pain of my hurt ankle, but not entirely. Each step was agony as I raced to catch up with Pete, who was already a hundred yards down the tunnel. Eventually, he stopped and waited for me to catch up, sensing that I was injured. What the hell happened back there? Where's Cinders? He asked, looking wildly over my shoulder. Run! I screamed. Forget Cinders! She's dead! They're all dead! This only seemed to confuse him further, and he stayed where he was as I ran past him grabbing his arm, yelling at him to keep moving. What the hell are you talking about? She can't be dead. I just saw her. We can't just leave her in there. Run! They're fucking zombies now! They're coming for us! Are you fucked in the head? I didn't bother arguing with him any further, since just then Cinders appeared out of the darkness behind him, racing toward us with her red and purple eyes ablaze with hunger. Spittle clung to her face and dribbled down her chin, her teeth snapping like a rabid dog as she ran like an Olympic sprinter straight at us. Several infected guards were behind her, trailing slowly compared to her speed. They were injured from her attacks and from their fall down the ladder, but she was healthy and full of inhuman speed thanks to whatever was in that vial. It was making her fast, and it was making her mean. Homicidal. I couldn't help but stare in terrified fascination as she leapt onto Pete and dove face first into his neck with her teeth snapping ferociously. Like a hungry, stray dog after cornering a rabbit, there was no mercy or remorse, only terror and shrill screaming until the sounds of that cut off abruptly. Blood sprayed into the air and gushed from his wounds onto the concrete and down into the sewer water. I stood transfixed, watching as she tore him to pieces. Eventually, I snapped out of it and ran, leaving the bag's money behind, no longer caring about them at all, only wanting to get away, only wanting to run as fast and far as possible from that place. The sounds of footsteps behind me grew louder as the ladder came into focus in the distance. I tried not to look back over my shoulder, knowing that would only waste precious seconds, but I couldn't help it. I glanced back to see Cinders was in pursuit trailing behind me a ways, but gaining fast. I didn't stand a chance of making it up the ladder before she got to me. I realized that, but continued to run, too terrified to give up. Duck! I heard someone scream from up ahead, and I looked to see a dim light above the ladder where the manhole cover had been opened. Someone was standing in the sewers up ahead, aiming a gun in my direction. It was my brother, Blake. I kept running until I was close enough for him to get a proper shot off, then I ducked out of the way just as the explosion of his gun reverberated through the sewers. He shot cinders again and again, each time hitting her square in the chest. And yet she kept coming. He shot her three more times, finally landing a shot on her right temple, stunning her. Cinders collapsed to the ground, a bleeding hole in the side of her head, exposing her skull. I started running towards Blake again, and a moment later she was up on her feet moving marginally slower now. Let's go! Blake screamed. Get up the ladder! Do you have it? Do you have the vial? I started climbing the ladder, shouting down at him. No, the vial broke! It's gone! Just forget about it! Let's get out of here! Continuing up the ladder, I thought he was following me, but... When I got to the top, I climbed out and looked down to see he was still in there. In the sewers, staring up at me. Blake, what are you doing? We gotta go! Get up here! He let out a deep sigh, looking remorseful. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, the 
this was the worst case scenario. I, I can't just leave. I have to try to stop this somehow, Brian. You go. You get as far away from this city. Get as far away as you can. No matter what you do, just, just run. Don't look back. They'll be coming for you, but they'll be coming for me first. What are you talking about, Blake? Get up here, please. I realized I was crying as I looked down at him in the darkness, my tears dripping down to land at his feet. He looked straight ahead again and began to fire his pistol, letting out a howling war cry. An instant later, an undead cinders dove into him and brought him to the ground. Gas had to get out of the van to put the manhole cover back on, sealing the scene beneath the ground. I wasn't able to tear my eyes away from what I was seeing down there, but I did hear the sounds of it even through the manhole cover. The sounds of my brother dying will ring in my ears every night when I fall asleep. For the rest of my life, I'm sure. My younger brother is getting eaten by zombies, I thought to myself in amazement. And I always thought those things only existed in the movies and on TV. Leave it to mankind to get creative with chemical warfare. Gas dragged me into the van and drove away from there. He seemed to know what was happening, as if Blake had let him and Cinders in on the secret. I'll never forgive him for that, for as long as I live. I don't think that will be very long, though. I don't think any of us have much time left. And I'm talking about humanity in general. A new virus is spreading in the sewers beneath Las Vegas. It's only a matter of time before it surfaces again. And when it does, it won't matter how far we run. It'll be coming for us all. Las Vegas was swarming with zombies ever since the apocalypse. As our helicopter swooped in low over the strip, I saw things had not improved in recent months. Hordes of decomposing ghouls were pressed up against each other in places. Crowds of them defying the laws of nature as they shuffled aimlessly around the town. The rumor was that the party kicked off right here in Sin City. After the virus ravaged it like every other major metropolis on Earth, nobody was brave or stupid enough to risk going in there again. At least, not until now. We had received reliable intel that the CEO of Proteon, the mega corporation responsible for the virus, had hidden an antidote inside the vault of the MGM Grand Casino. That made sense, since casino vaults tended to be far more secure than bank vaults, and the people who owned those places didn't ask questions, as long as clients paid their exorbitant fees. So it seemed possible that the intel was correct, and if it was, that meant a potential cure, or at the very least a vaccine that we could replicate in our labs. There would be no more fear of zombie bites with a vaccine in circulation. We would essentially become immune as long as our chemists could recreate the formula. The only problem was nobody could access the casino vault without going through a horde of zombies, and it's kinda hard to crack a safe under that sort of pressure, much less a high-tech casino vault. Ghouls were roaming the Las Vegas Strip in droves. They never rested and they never slept, just waiting for fresh meat to arrive, and instantly pouncing on anyone who set foot in their territory. Now we were about to invade their city, and none of us felt comfortable with that idea. One thing we did have going for us was the fact that our organization, International Ghoul Hunters Operation Roundtable, or Igor for short, had access to a few pilots who still knew how to fly a helicopter. This meant we had a way in and out, without having to fight our way through the city streets which were overrun by undead. But we would need to be careful, and more than one of us could die during the operation, we were well aware of that. We're coming in hot. I want everyone locked and loaded, announced the leader of the squad, Lieutenant Bream, hefting his M134 minigun into his lap. A trail of bullets was feeding into it from a coil on his back, which would allow him to fire approximately 2,000 rounds per minute if he so desired. I'd rigged up the mechanism myself. The huge casino building loomed large up ahead, amidst the smoldering rubble that had once been the Las Vegas Strip. I had been to the city once before, when the world was still alive, and it was strange to see the place at night now. 
The bright neon fluorescence which the town was so well known for were dim and lifeless. The billboards and casinos just dark silhouettes against a backdrop of desert and skies. Only the streets were alive and filled with raging throngs of sun-baked zombies. As our pilot touched down on the casino's roof, the group of us climbed out of the helicopter, proceeding in a tight formation towards the door which led into the stairwell. The chopper took off, leaving us alone to fight our way down towards the basement. All of the elevators would be out of commission, which meant we would be taking the stairs. And who knew what we would find during our descent? We made our way down, finding it mostly clear except for a few stragglers. This made sense. Zombies are lazy, and they tend to move downhill. Still, we knew our luck would run out very quickly, as the place would be packed on the lower levels. We'd been through scenarios like this before. We were the best of the best that Eeyore had to offer, and each of us had nerves of steel. At the front of the pack was our squad leader, Lieutenant Bream. Long before the zombie apocalypse, Bream had been deep in the shit. He'd served in Afghanistan and Iraq, then Ukraine and China, and all over the Western Hemisphere during the first few years of World War III. His greatest asset was his ability to come up with alternative plans on the fly, and that's what he did as we came face to face with a crowd of zombies just before the basement, where we needed to exit the stairwell. The horde of them raced up towards us in a mob which trailed down for several floors. My heart skipped a beat as I spun around and hurried back up to the main level. We were forced to flee from the confines of the stairwell, and wound up on the zombie-infested casino floor. Dozens of zombies were in close proximity, running at full sprints toward us when they saw us, and Bream immediately began to let loose with his minigun, firing a barrage of bullets which killed every walker in sight, but also drew more out of hiding. He cut those ones down too, so that none of us had to fire a shot. At least, not yet. Next in line of command for our operation, there was Cassie. She was the navigator for the mission and had her maps for the casino in her hands, tracing escape routes with her fingers. This way, she told us, pointing towards another hallway leading out of the gaming area. The whole place was a wreck. Blackjack tables were flipped over and slot machines toppled. Dead bodies were everywhere, many of them still moving, amidst piles of looted chips and cash which littered the casino floor. A green sign mounted on the wall indicated there was another set of stairs, and we broke into a run. My weapons of choice were a pair of pistols. I raised them to zombie eye level and unleashed a hail of bullets which exploded the skulls of several ghouls nearby as we raced past. One managed to grab hold of my arm, raking its rotten fingernails across my flesh. Its open mouth was inches away from my neck when I felt a spray of cool blood land on my face. Cassie had incapacitated the zombie with her sword through its skull and was wiping the blade clean on her pants. She winked at me saucily as we rushed to catch up with the others, having momentarily fallen behind. Fred was the tank of our group, throwing zombies out of the way with his bare hands and hefting a razor-sharp double-sided axe, which he swung around around his head. He was a seven-foot-tall mountain of muscle who could break down almost any door, and if he couldn't go through it, he'd go through the wall next to it instead. In typical Fred fashion, he broke down the locked door to the employee stairwell with his shoulder, and we found with great relief that it was empty. Since this was a staff entrance, it was less frequently used, and that was perfect for us. We bolted down to the lowest level with only a few dozen undead casino employees trying to eat our flesh along the way. Finally, after cutting down countless ghouls, we made it to the vault room. It was behind a series of locked doors, which was less than perfect, since we were still being trailed by a group of walkers from the gaming floor who had followed us through the broken door. Lamar, our technical expert, went to work on the first door, which had a numbered keypad beside it. He pried the faceplate off the panel, revealing wires underneath. He began stripping these quickly, his face beating with sweat as the rest of us fought off a fresh group of undead in the narrow corridor. Our ammunition was almost depleted, so we resorted to using other weapons instead. I took out my katana and Bream produced a collapsible spear, thrusting it into the onslaught of attackers. After several harrowing minutes, I heard a click from behind me and turned around as another group of zombies came around the corner. I'm in, Lamar yelled a second later. We all followed him inside and locked the door behind us, just as the rotted corpses began to jiggle the handle from outside. This hallway was empty, thankfully, but there was still a smell pervading the place. Not the typical dead body smell we were used to, either. This was something else. The group of us continued up the short hallway towards another thick steel door, Past that was the vault, and we would finally be at our goal. 
Surprisingly, this next door opened easily, as if unlocked. Lamar made a soft whistling sound as he pushed it open, looking inside. What in the name of... We readied our weapons as he trailed off. Uh, at least it's not walkers. Come on, you guys gotta see this. We entered the antechamber of the vault, seeing that the huge safe door was open. It looked as if something terrible had happened here, inside this room. There was blood everywhere. The interior of the vault was blackened from an explosion. Multiple explosions by the look of it. And there was a huge hole in the floor where it looked as if a bomb had gone off. What the hell is all this? Bream muttered, walking into the vault. Piles of cash were still sitting at its center. Once upon a time, that cash would have meant a lot to me. But now it just looked like green, useless paper. Is it possible someone beat us to the punch? Cassie asked, looking at Bream. Maybe it's true what they say. Maybe this is really where it all started. I have a growing suspicion that's right. But if they kept the virus here, maybe they kept the antidote in here too. Lamar took a hesitant step backwards, hearing that the original virus could have been stored in this room. Do you think it's safe? Bream thought about this for a second before shaking his head. I don't know. It might not be. The group of us stood there silently for a few seconds, considering our options. Ah, screw it, Cassie said finally, throwing up her hands. We came this far. I'm going in. If I turn into a walker, shoot me in the back of the head, will ya? Wait, hold on, Fred yelled, hurrying after her. The two of them entered the vault and began to look around. Fred zoned in on one section where a bomb had blown the doors off several lockboxes. What's this green shit? He mumbled, pulling his hand back after touching one of them. Careful, Fred, I yelled, alarm bells ringing in my head. There's a vial here. This could be it. Maybe it's the antidote. Ah! Damn broken glass. A sound from behind us caught my attention, and I looked back over my shoulder in surprise to see the door collapsing inwards from where we'd entered. Dozens of zombies pressed up against one another, forcing themselves through the door, their rotten skin bulging and sloughing away where it met resistance. We've got company, yelled Bream, wheeling around and beginning to thrust his spear into the eye sockets of the advancing horde. My katana made short work of a tall, lumbering walker with a horse-like face. His large, buck teeth appeared capable of devastating damage until his head hit the floor. Fred, no! Stop! I heard Cassie screaming from the vault and turned to look just in time to see Fred take her head between his hands and pull it off from her shoulders like a bully removing a Barbie head. A fountain of blood erupted from her neck as her body collapsed backwards, and Fred took a large bite from her face like an apple. His eyes were clouded with purple veins reflecting red light back at me. Shit, Fred's infect. Lamar began saying. Then his words were cut short and devolved into a bubbling gurgle as a walker tore out his throat with his yellow teeth. He clutched the wound as his skin turned paler, falling to the ground. Shit, looks like it's just you and me, kid. Bream said, his eyes darting around at the encroaching horde. You think we stand a chance? I asked, noting the fear in his eyes. I had never seen Lieutenant Bream scared. He just shook his head as he raised his spear. Nope. But let's take as many of them to hell with us as we can. Sound like a plan? I nodded, and as I did, something caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. A glint of shiny chrome within the vault, in the center of that blackened hole in the floor. For some reason, I thought I saw something dangling from it, like a, a rope ladder leading down. Hang on, boss. We may not have to cash in our chips just yet. Bream looked at me, thrusting his spear into the face of a nearby zombie, without any effort. I grabbed his arm and pulled him into the vault, where zombie Fred was now moaning and shuffling toward us, his arms outstretched. Rrrr, he groaned, a guttural sound escaping from his blood-stained lips. I got him. I said, sidestepping his slowly reaching hands and leaping into the air to slice his face in half. The top part of his skull slid away like an anime cartoon, dropping to the floor with a wet, meaty plop. Blood sprayed everywhere, jetting from his arteries. I neared the hole in the floor, seeing that there was indeed a rope ladder leading down to the sewers. That was where that shitty smell was coming from, I realized. Holy hell, good job, kid, Bream said, seeing the hole. Get down that ladder, I'll hold him off. He thrust his spear out at the approaching zombie horde with pinpoint strikes, like a Spartan warrior perfectly weaponized for the purposes of destruction. I looked down at the rope ladder and began to climb into the sewers below, trying to breathe through my mouth to avoid the smell, but that was impossible. 
My feet landed in ankle-deep water, and I looked around in the darkness, hearing the grunts of effort from Bream up above me in the vault. A second later, he was climbing down too, and I waited for him before beginning to move deeper into the darkness. I heard his feet splash down into the puddles, and we started running through the sewers, deeper into the black abyss, hoping it was safe, but not knowing for sure. Zombies were climbing down after us, falling into the sewer from the vault. We heard them pursuing us a second later. The two of us arrived at an intersection where four tunnels came together, and we looked around, trying to decide which way to go. A sound of movement came from ahead to the right, and then a foot splashed in the water to my left. From ahead came more noises, grunting and groaning and the sounds of shuffling feet in the sewage. As my eyes finally adjusted to the darkness, I saw we were surrounded. Hundreds of red eyes reflected the dim light all around us. Bream let out a deep sigh from beside me. Okay, now we're gonna die, he said simply. Here, let me help you out. His spear came through my jaw a second later, and I felt an instant of pain before it went through my skull, killing me instantly. In death, I can't help but feel a deep gratitude. I only wish I could have returned the favor. The story was written by me, and a variation of it previously appeared on the Dr. No Sleep podcast. If you want to hear more stories written by me and other great authors, check out his podcast and YouTube channel, where he also shares high-quality horror animations and audio works. Links can be found in the description. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zuall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blairian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, and LaDonna Spivey. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, you'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Characters have already started appearing in stories, so check that out if you're interested. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening, please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Have a great night.